have any issues, any of the no. material? No, I mean, I basically have some basic materials without getting in the, you know, secret of the... Trade secret. <laughs> yeah, that know. is uh, <laughs> sacred, but uh, basically I have to, you know, process the ingredients. I don't uh, create any additional burden on the septic uh, system or anything like that. Okay, good, thank you. Um, when I open up the public, anybody wish to speak on this issue? Do you have any letters at all, phone calls? We did not. I'll close the public hearing part and come back to uh, the uh, requirements for the special exception. And so I'm going to read in the question and you answer it the, the best sure. you feel comfortable, okay? The proposed use will not create unsanitary and unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Um, we uh, don't need to dispose of anything when we create these products. I basically have to measure the ingredients, mix them. I won't describe the whole process, but basically it doesn't create any waste. Okay. Um, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. We do not anticipate any additional traffic uh, required more than what we use as our own home. Any, any deliveries that need to be done, or is it all? I mean, uh, if I order some uh, ingredients that come in the mail, it's just a normal uh, postal thing, so nothing additional. The proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from uh, those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. We are in farmland, so I mean, down the road from us is Broughton Farm Day have a much bigger thing than us. We are just, you know, small ants. <laughs> Maybe not for long. Hopefully. Uh, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood. Did I read that one? I'm sorry. Uh, no. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on the water supplies. I don't uh, use water for the product. So, okay. yeah. And the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. We are not adding any additional structures. You showed the two rooms that it was going to be in. Yeah. You're not in a shoreland zone. Uh, you have the financial ability to, to do this, and um, the proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. Um, I don't think it's applicable because I'm not uh, using our home as a store. You know, it's just to manufacture the things, well. which is completely quiet. And uh, you have the, you own the property, is that your property? Yes, yes. Thank you. And then uh, anything that you'd like to add to this at all? Thank you. The uh, next section would be the requirements for an in-home occupation. In two sections, it's uh, section six, page 920. Uh, let's see, and that just is a definition. I'll just read it in. Section nine, I'm sorry, and nine B is the other. Yeah, page 37 or 41. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read in the sections that require for home occupation, okay? The occupation or pro profession shall be re carried on wholly within the principal pr dwelling and uh, within the building accessory there, too. And you look like you're just using your kitchen and yep. your dining room or living yep. room. Okay. The home occupation shall be clearly incidental and secondary to use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. We, of course, we live in the house, so that's what we use it for. Uh, no more than one person who is not a resident of the dwelling shall be employed in the occupation. Are you doing it with any employees? Or? I do not uh, plan to have any em employees. I mean, if I get to the point where I need an employee, I think I will be happy. But I understand <laughs> that now more than one. Okay. Uh, do you want any signage? or do you um, I don't have plans right now. I am allowed to have, am I allowed to have a sign? You can have a sign up to six square feet. At the, you have to meet the sign regulations. Uh, and what I would probably suggest is that you request it now, but if you don't use it, that's fine. Okay, yes. Then I think it would be better to request it rather than and not. And what it would be limited to is six square feet. Yes. And it can only say... Yeah, the brand name. Right. 
Uh, and, and actually, the, the, zone, the, uh, the code enforcement officers can help you with yes. that interpretation yes. if it's approved. Thank you. Uh, there should be no exterior display, no exterior storage of materials, and no other exterior indication of the home occupation or variation from the residential character of the principal uh, building. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, if I was to have any extra stock or something, I would just keep a small box in the basement. Nothing would be outside the house. And there's no nuisance generated by uh, offensive noise, smoke, vibration, dust, odors, heat, or glare? No. And you're not going to be generating any more traffic because you're not letting anybody come to your home? And you have excuse me, uh, sufficient uh, off-street parking provided to meet normal requirements. If you had an employee come on, you've got room for parking. We have a very long uh, driveway, okay. so that accommodates quite a few cars. Uh, and uh, did, have, is any, have you had a chance to do the calculations mm -hmm. with others? That's okay. It's in the summary. Okay, thank you. She did about 18.3%. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that space, um, I didn't do the math. So we've 18.3% is what you can use, and that's acceptable. Okay, it needs to be below 20. Um, and uh, home occupations may include retail sales subject to the following limitations. And this is a little tricky. Uh, the total area devoted to retail sales is limited to 400 square feet and must be fully enclosed within the building. Do you have any plans for doing that at all? Or to have like a store yes. on the property? I mean, not at this uh, point, but if in the future, I mean, the challenge here is that I have to know what I'm applying for, but I depend on how successful this is going to be, and there's no way to predict it at this point. As, as uh, opposed to the other angle with the with assignment, my advice would be to, if you end up getting to the point where you have a retail, I, I would probably suggest you come back. It's up to you. Okay. Do but I have to apply again? All she has to do is meet those performance standards. Oh, that's okay. perfect. So, you so I have don't have to, to apply for anything? You just need to go to the code enforcement office. Okay. And, they'll and they will explain to me if I... If you choose to do that. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Um, let's see. I think that's... You're not a lobster man, so you have to look. And you're not repairing cars. So that would be those requirements. I'll go to the board for questions, comments. This seems pretty straightforward to me, to be honest. So, so, you, so you don't expect um, retail people to come to your house? Yeah, because uh, my goal is not to spend my time, you know, having a schedule in which people can come and purchase anything. Uh, that would be more time consuming for me. Uh, it makes much more sense for me to uh, contact stores and, uh, you know, have an order. I go and deliver the order and then they sell it in as long as they need. It's, I think it's more sustainable that way. Great. Thank you. Is there any for development of the product, is there any cooking or odors or anything like that that could come out of your house and neighbors would smell or? No, I, I don't think any more than our normal cooking that we do every day. I mean, um, if Be you careful, smell that. smell my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you smell that bar, it has a very faint, uh, uh, you know, aroma. So it's unlikely that it would be felt from the other room, never mind from outside the house. Okay. And are you planning on having distribution for yourself, bring them to stores or like a UPS or a, a um, FedEx or something like that, pick up and distribute to stores? Or what's your plan? Your plan is basically to drop off. My plan at the moment is to drop off the, you know, like small boxes in whatever store requires it. Okay. Um, even if I was to mail something, I would probably go to the post office and, you know, drop it there. Okay. Other questions or motion from the board? I move approval. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, discussion on the motion? Um, I'll just throw something out. No matter how it goes in the vote, I think you can probably guess. But j have you had an attorney talk to you about all the issues? If you haven't, do that. Um, uh, if you want, you can call and I can recommend somebody or whatever. You just, if you're new at business, most of us here have started businesses, uh, and you want to just do it right. You don't want to get hurt, and you don't want to lose your house for something stupid. Okay. And so just have it, have, make sure you be careful. It's easy. It's great. Congratulations. I think starting your own business is an amazing thing. I started a jerky company. So I, uh, I think it's fantastic. But 
that being said, you want to do it right. Okay. okay. Uh, any uh, discussion on the motion? We see none. All in favor? As unanimous. Congratulations. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a nice evening. Soap back, guys. <laughs> 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 you notice how they pull. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Uh, variance appeals are always a challenge, so I'll, I'll just warn you heads up. That's always a tough one for us. Yep. Uh, but that being said, uh, this is appeal number 2587. It's variance appeal request by David Haskell and Sarah D uh, Douglas, 9 Shipwreck Road, Sisters Map U1, parcel 80. If you could do me a favor and just state your name, address, and we'll go from there. Yep, Travis Kinney. I live here in Scarborough. Gulf Shore Design is the name of my architecture firm. Could you spell your last name for us, please? Yep, Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y. Thank you, Mr. Kinney. Uh, if you'd like to just kind of explain what we're trying to accomplish, we'll go from there. Yep, this is, a, as you can see in your packet, we're looking at renovating this small uh, cottage uh, down at Nine Shipwreck. Uh, road and we want to do a, the allowed expansion by shoreland zoning um, with a steeper roof and a dormer all with this calculations in there for the work that would be expanded within the 75 foot setback um, which is delineate, delineated on the survey as well um, but this, so the variance that we're looking at is for the Higgins Beach um, character um, criteria for this particular house. And it's kind of a catch-22. I haven't done full-blown architectural drawings yet because um, we're not sure what we would be approved for, but there is a floor plan there that we're leaning toward. Um, and so what we want to do is expand, infill one corner of the house and put a small addition on another inside corner of the house. Um, and at no point would those additions increase the nonconformity closer to the sideline setbacks. It just extends existing lines on this cottage. Um, and I noticed you've given us some maps, uh, but I don't see shipwreck list listed on here. Maybe just missed it. That's a flood plan, right? But yeah, it would be on the survey. But it, I'm just kind of curious where it's at in the, in the universe. This is, it's marked as Kent Street, but it's actually shipwrecked. Oh, thank you. Okay, so FEMA's really good at misnaming streets. <laughs> and elevations. That's why the, the relief is so slow getting there. They can't find it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this, it's not even shown on FEMA. If anyone <laughs> dealt with FEMA, we would all agree. Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I had to deal with them. Um, Okay, so on uh, what's making this a little bit difficult is uh, some of the information you provided is excellent, but we don't have specifics as to what you want to do. I, I was a little bit confused. It looks like you're just trying to raise the roof lines. Yep. We're, the, we're, so the if you look, at the, probably the best thing to do is to look at the photo, the photo of the house. You want to take the ridge of the main house and elevate that up, and install an ocean side. Um, shed dormer and there's a 3d model in there that I drew to help me determine exactly the maximum allowed 30% volume increase that I can do within the shoreland zone um, and that 3d model is kind of near the, the back of the packet and all that's doing is kind of giving me a clay model of 
here's the amount of volume that the code allows me to do within the 75 foot setback. And, and why did you go volume as opposed to square footage? Because in Scarborough, you still need to go by 30% volume or 30% square footage, which is whichever is the most restrictive. Fine. Some of the towns that go into the highest ridge point, which luckily that hasn't been the case in Scarborough yet. I honestly thought it was either or. Uh, it's most restrictive. So what I do, so there's calculations on there's a 3D model for volume in the previous two pages are the square foot calculations, just looking at directly down and plan. So you take the two combined together and you just don't exceed either of them. That's a good explanation. Um. So, so that the expansion in the 75 foot zone, those, um, the 3D model and the floor plan diagrammatic diagrammatically lists out what's allowed and the calculations are all there. Beyond the 75 foot, the expansion is, doesn't matter the shoreland zoning expansion, but it does matter to the, the, the uh, Higgins Beach character study. So half this packet just shows that we're in compliance with shoreland zoning. And I didn't do any of the number checking. You yeah, I've, I've checked. The, the math is good. The math is good. You, if, if you trust me, the ma I, I did check the math. I didn't. So I think, <laughs> I think what you need to do is focus more on the request for relief, what, what he's asking for for these setbacks, as he explained, as uh, Travis explained. He's basically not going any closer to the property lines. The whole building is non-conforming, existing. It's all... It's all wrong. It's, it doesn't meet any of the setbacks. It's been there for 80 years or whatever. But um, so the the request is to infill on one corner, and then to add a sort of a, a porch extension on the other uh, corner of the the house. Neither one of those infills is going any closer to the property line, and also to bump the roof up from this to this, creating more space and put the two dormers on the roof. So there's there's a, an expansion vertically and some additional dormers and then some infill of structure in the corners on the street side of the property. Do the infills affect going up? The infills do not affect going up. Right. So, so the, the, the difficulty is when you take this allowed expansion and then you go and look at the, the Higgins Beach character based zoning uh, ordinance, you can't meet some of that criteria, like their definition of like a, an inset porch or wraparound porch. This this specific, you know, architectural dimensions that force the aesthetics to be nice, which I get because there's some weird stuff happening down there. Um, so again, the catch-22 is all I provide you in the very last page is a sketch of, hey, this would be a nice-looking um, cottage for that area, but it doesn't specifically meet like say an eight foot deep porch. We might I think only end up with a six foot deep um, porch. But what I'm driving at is that the aesthetics of what we end up with is going to be improvement of what's there today and aesthetically it's, it's going to meet um, what this character based study is trying to achieve down at Higgins Beach. Just to kind of a quick and please jump in if you, you see something I'm on, wrong on this. Um, I think this is kind of three pieces. Number one, the pulling up, which usually we don't have a problem with, so that I think is fairly clean and easy, I've, I've, although we, th we need to worry about the 30%, but that seems to be covered. Um, the extensions are the, are the bump outs, which often are a concern, and trying to line up with the new uh, requirements of or, or recommendations of the new zone, the C. I keep on wanting to use the zone. The, uh, I even printed it. CR1. The CR1 zone. Uh, but we've also got the problem of not having enough information, in my personal opinion, so that we don't run into the problem we just had, where we had to kind of put the, the CEO on a spot with leaving him with a gray area. Yeah. So I, I guess my question to the board is, do we feel like we have enough information to carry on the conversations and then maybe need to come back with the the final drawing for final approval, or do you want it, do you feel comfortable that there's enough information here that you can make a decision, 
or do you want to send it all back to get the, the or, or I guess those are three choices. I, I think if we're going to send it back, I understand exactly what he's saying is that he doesn't want to go to the expense of, of doing full-blown drawings if he doesn't have some kind of guidance as to what we might accept. Right. Is that? Yeah, so if the, if, if we would be allowed to do the lateral expansion, the floor plan, then, I know, then as the architect, I know my floor plan is going to work. I know how all the structure is going to work up above. Um, I could then do a set of drawings that you could then look from an aesthetic perspective could, to say, all right, yeah, this, this meets the character guidelines, you know, that we're trying to shoot for. <coughs> and this is a variance appeal. So kind of coming back to that, and again, I'm going to need your help on this one. It, the, if, if they're just coming forward with going up with the, the uh, dormers, does that still kick us into the variance category it, because it's in shoreland? It does. This is a tricky one because, as I said, as I said before, <coughs> just about everything about this dwelling is non-conforming with regard to space and bulk requirements, setbacks, that, that stuff. Normally, the dormer expansions would meet our, our dormer exception, if you will. There's an exception for non-conforming structures where you can add a dormer without it being considered an increase in, or an expansion of that structure if it meets certain criteria. Mm -hmm. And that would, with the exception that everything about the structure is non-conforming, and so um, part of the problem is they're going to pop the roof up. So that sort of, if, if they weren't popping the roof up and only adding the dormer, they wouldn't have to come for a variance for that. But because they're popping the roof up and adding the dormer, the dormers in and of themselves would be fine, but it's the popping up of the roof. Popping up the roof. That's a vertical expansion of a non-conforming structure. Okay. So, so maybe to make this a little simpler, in, you, the board can certainly look at it any way it wants to, but we, we had a long conversation, I think, about this because there are so many angles to it, okay? It's very complicated and it's very hard to sort out. I bought three moxies. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that, to me, one way to look at it and kind of try to simplify it is, is let's look at the footprint first, okay? okay? The footprint is, it really, um, is speaking to the setbacks. The setbacks are what the existing structure are. They're not asking for any any additional um, encroachment into the setbacks other than infill. So, so for example, in your packets, I wish it, the, the, the audio visual stuff isn't working tonight, so I can't use my pointer and put stuff up on the flat screen. So if you look but in I your packets... If you want, if the camera would take it, just... It, it, it's not going to make any difference to you. You're going to get as much out of that blank screen as you do when there's something on there. I'm anyway. using that other people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, so if you look in your packets, there's a photograph. It has the car sitting here in the yard. Yeah. So if you look at that, one of the asks or requests, if you will, is to put an additional bump out in this little corner right here. Okay? So that's, it's going to be right in line with this wall with this wall here and just coming this direction and infilling that corner. Okay. So the camera wants to shoot on this just so that somebody else can see. How far out? Yeah, I, I'm getting there. I just, I have, I have that sheet right here. So that little addition... Does that bump out like about three feet by six feet? Um, does it come all the way out? It does not come all the way out, no. Okay. So from the camera's point okay. of view... Okay, so, want so to currently, currently the setback from the front from the street side property line to this wall right here, okay, no. is 12 foot 4 inches. The camera could, could do me a favor and just shoot at my, my desk from above so that people in, on TV can see what we're talking about. That would be helpful. The closest point of the structure here where this sort of porch exists is, is only 1 foot 3 from the property line. What they're proposing is to add a little addition in this corner that would then reduce that 12 foot 4 distance to the existing wall would now become 6 foot 8. So it's basically almost cutting it in half. They're, they're adding about half that width. Right. 
it's no closer than the nearest point of the existing structure to the property line and it's no closer on the sideline than the existing structure. So it's sort of a, a half infill, if you will. Okay. And it's not adding any additional heights to the structure, it's just bringing this out and down, okay? So it's just a, a minor addition to the front, kind of making it more um, symmetrical instead of a salt box look. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one footprint piece, okay? The other footprint piece is that right here, if you turn to the photo in your packet, I feel like I'm doing your presentation track. I like it. <laughs> Shut me up at any point. No, I'll just mark you up 15%. <laughs> Um, so, so here on this picture, which is sort of the other end of the cottage, yep. you see this little entry step here? Right where the stairs are. Right where the stairs are? We want to square that corner of the building off. What they're proposing, what they're asking is, is, is to just infill that corner. So that's this picture, no, and, and where the stairs That was go? the first picture. This is the picture yep. here. Yep. So again, camera so infilling on this that. little corner where this door and steps is. Well, this this picture here doesn't look like it's in. They there. haven't. I don't think on your 3D no. picture you didn't include that in. No, there. that was just to show the aesthetics that we're heading toward. That, that gives you a feeling for what the, the building's going to look like. So what would you do with the steps? That's where the steps the would be the other infill. The 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 one that would reduce the setback to six foot eight. It would now be on the other side of the house. So oh, okay, it would move from here. Over here. Okay, I get. That's it. what they're proposing. Okay. okay. Well, this, would the steps on the other side be in addition to the bump out? Yes, it, and but that's not shown as the square foot increase because it's allowed in the uh, in the character study that the stoop. Yeah, the stoop can can be. Um, and the character study. It's allowed. So we're going to. We have to. Part of the complication here is we have to raise the building up to the to the flood zone, the structure. Are you going over the, one foot over the flood zone? Right. Okay, so, so the, the real reason that this uh, this is coming forward as a variance is twofold. Number one, improve the property, but to get it above the flood zone. Is that correct? Which would trigger the number one and would answer your first question. Mm -hmm. Going above the flood zone is not part of the variance. We we have to meet that requirement because we're tripping these other. But if you didn't do anything, what I'm trying to get at is your your biggest in issue is going to be number one, which is the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return. Uh, doing a bump out or doing a roof, that doesn't meet that requirement. But right, doing the trying to help you out to so thirty percent. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just from a practical point of view. If I'm looking at this honestly. You're trying to get this, the whole scheme of this thing is it's going to make this more conforming. And again, I'm not, I'm not real, I'm, out of, I'm a little bit out of what I should be saying, but my understanding is the goal is to make this a better home. In the process of doing that, it trips all the other regulations, which forces you into a situation where it would require a variance as opposed to any other type. You're in the shoreland zone. You are non-conforming, um, and the hard and by requirement, you, the hardship is the fact that you have no choice but to go up a foot, or whatever the footage you have to go up to get above the foot. Right, line. right. Yes, there's an allowed expansion right, right. that we want to take advantage of. Um, the aesthetic part, which the Higgins Beach character study is is, is pushing toward, we can't really show you yet because. <coughs> I don't want to do a set of drawings on an expansion I'm not sure I'm allowed to have yet. But once I know I can do the square foot expansion, then we can come back and prove that we would meet the character-based study. So, so that point, and, and I don't know how many of you read the staff comments that I sent you, um, but one of the things you need to be clear on <coughs> is are you being asked to grant relief from the character-based code elements of design? Things like porch depth and width, um, fenestration, windows, glass area, roof pitch, or are you 
being asked simply for space in bulk reduction, okay? Because if you're only going to grant or if you're only going to consider space in bulk setback type issues, then the character stuff would be left to staff to review when the building plans are finalized right. and they come to, come to us. So is that allowed? For you to just review the to, to make sure the criteria is met, but what again? What if the porch is we six do. foot deep and not eight? Um, right, but but really, te technically, you have you have a front porch. It's non-conforming, right. but it's already there. Mm -hmm. And so, by for example, if you were granted permission for the infill on that porch, it really wouldn't change anything about that porch. Right. Right. So, so it wouldn't have to, at that point, meet the character code because it, it may or may not meet it now. It's just simply an infill of a small corner of that. Right. Um, there's, there's some glass, I think, on the porch now. It's, it looks like an enclosed porch. Right, right. It does it meet the standards? Maybe, maybe not. But you're not really changing that other than to add a little infill on the corner. Right. So I think that would sort of be a moot point where we would probably really pay some attention to the character code would be, for example, your dormers that you're putting on. Is yep. there enough glass area on the dormers? Yep. Do the dormers have the right pitch, yep. the right the width, setbacks, the yeah. setbacks? And that's yep. staff, right? That would be staff stuff. Okay. And, and I, I, based on what I can see, and I, I'm not going to say 100% that I think what you got here, those elements can all meet the character code, but I think they're pretty close. Yeah. From what you know, from the information that we currently have, yep. so I really, I don't believe that you'd have a hard time complying with the character elements. Where you can't comply is the dimensional stuff, the setbacks, right? And and, and that's so I think that that's where the board needs to sort of focus and live in yep. reviewing this. It's really the dimensional, and, and again, it's a matter of. See, our ordinance doesn't say that infilling on a non-conforming structure is not an increase in the non-conformance. Our ordinance doesn't say that. Some ordinances do. Some ordinance says as long as you infill and don't go any closer, we don't consider that an expansion or of, of the non-conformity. Our ordinance doesn't say that. Does it say anything to it? Or? No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. So, but, but under normal circumstances, so I guess. So if you have a non-conforming structure with a corner, you can't infill it without increasing the non-conformance. We consider that a non an increase in the non-conformance. Okay. As a okay. town, just because we As don't, a town. We don't, because we don't say otherwise. Because in other towns like Falmouth, Cumberland, and Yarmouth, you can infill that inside corner because their rationale and the way they have it written up is that you're not increasing the non-conformity of getting closer to a property line or setback line. But they specifically say specifically that in their that. ordinance. We are silent Scarborough on that doesn't. fact. So unless you specifically say it, it's not permitted by, by you know, the virtue of being silent on it. All right. So, so really, what they're asking for is permission, you know, relief, if you will, to do those infills, those that they're they're proposing, and also to expand the, the roof height because they're not just elevating the structure for floodplain compliance, they're, they're increasing the pitch, which is actually making the roof more compliant with the character base code. Correct. <laughs> That's important. Yeah, so there, there's all these elements that are playing against each other, but they're actually improving the compliance of the roof pitch, and uh, in fact, I think making it. You know, the, right. you're making the, the required, you're within the range, required range of, of pitch. Right now, it's too flat. It doesn't meet it. Right. It doesn't fall in any of the aesthetic categories right. for housing so, styles. So by currently. increasing the pitch to get a little bit of headroom upstairs and make it more, more effective with your dormer additions, they're actually improving from a character code aspect the roof pitch. But they're also increasing the height of a non-conforming structure. And, and remember, we just adopted language in the ordinance that said if, if you were doing nothing to the roof, but you were, you were doing enough in the structure that triggered the substantial improvement, 50% of the market value of the structure, you have to elevate the structure if it doesn't meet Correct. floodplain. You can do that without it being considered, without having to come to get a variance to do it. 
unless they're in this situation. But in this situation, they're also popping the roof out. Okay. So, so now you're... <laughs> So, okay, so, so all bets are off, you're popping the roof up, and yes, you do have to elevate. So it's not the elevating of the structure that they have to ask a variance for, it's the popping up of the roof. But the elevating of the structure could be the reason, see what I'm worried about is number one, the land in question cannot yield a reason, and, and I'm, the, mm -hmm. here's, here's I, I think you probably want to reword this to some degree yep. or whatever it's worth. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return. Applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not uh, determined by personal circumstance of the of the applicant. Now, I'm not trying to support you one way or the other, but I do try to play fair. And and you can tell that, that, that uh, Ms. Long is doing the same thing. Your, your answer to that question basically takes you out of the game. Well, so what I'd like to do is help you not answer it the way you answered it. Okay. Because right. there are a variety of ways of answering the question, and the right answer is to get the right answer. Yeah, and not, that's written, not to play semantics. Right. Well, the semantics is, is near the end of that, which talks about this. This site is ten feet narrower than all the other adjacent properties because we think that one time it was a paper street or Ver Verdap Street used to go right down to the beach. Um, so I guess my my question coming back to what. Mr. Longstaff brought out, and uh, board jump in if you feel like you want to at any point. But I, I guess number one is a big challenge for me. Uh, I knew I was going to have a problem with it. I actually reprinted the codes for the for the character-based zoning because of it. Uh, we know this is where the town wants to go. So we yeah. So so part of that is currently, if you look at that character-based study, I tried to figure out. Is this a bungalow? Is this a cottage? Or is this a house? And if you go by roof pitches, square footage, it doesn't fall into any of them. I think I think the issue that we've got here is that if in the, if in fact you're trying to improve this, make it the way it is, the you can't do that unless you raise the property up. Then the question comes down to being the infill, and do we find that under normal circumstances we usually say. That and again, the consistency is one of those things that's just great and just bad. Um, we usually say that it sits in the footprint. We don't really have too much of a problem with the variance appeal but in those circumstances. This is the mess that I kind of found myself into trying to figure it out. Was that's a true statement, but from a practical point of view, at what point does it matter if, in fact, it's tripping? The requirement to have to come back forward anyway. Why not do it right, and why not be more consistent with the character-based code that the town is leaning toward? And are we being um, over aggressive by saying we're not going to give the infill? Uh, and that's kind of where I'm struggling with. And I think once we deal with that issue, if the board says no, the, the infill is inappropriate, then you can make your plans accordingly. Um, and but my personal opinion is that it, it doesn't matter once we've triggered the value of the land becomes useless if you don't raise it and the cost of the difference I kind of don't see the insult as a big deal so my personal opinion on it which is different than normal is the infill's de minimis to the benefit the benefit of getting more consistent with the Scarborough's character-based zoning overrides that de minimis change, and we have triggered by default by doing anything. I mean, you leave this property there forever, and sooner or later it's going to fall down. But it does a reasonable return. Well, now you got to raise. You're basically raising the whole property. Right. So you're. <clears throat> to me, it's like do it right the first time and. Um, yeah, I, I, I would I would certainly agree with that. Um, and and um, uh, again, if you just let it fall down, you're not going to have a reasonable return. Okay. And so I, it, like Brian mentioned, if because of the because of the new standards as far as as the the character standards on it. Um, it, we're, it's kind of it's a double-edged sword here, but I think that it, it's going to make it look more compliant, certainly with the 
with the character-based stuff, if we do allow the the, the infill, uh, than if we don't. And so I, I'm for it. My big thing on this is I understand what you're saying about not having a plan and stuff, but it'd be much easier if we were looking at that plan with the dimensions. And I understand the character. You're, you're, you're wanting us to give you that. No. Uh, Brian said that that would be administrative to meet the requirements of the character study. So really, we're just looking at the, the bulk. The, the yeah. I mean, right. If, if I may, but the infill, that's what I'm talking about. We're looking at the infill only, really, right that, now. That's what I was saying earlier. Okay. Don't, I, my suggestion is, you can do what you want. You're going to anyway. <laughs> my suggestion is, don't concern yourself with the character stuff. Concern yourself with dimensional stuff. Right, that's what I'm the talking The same about. way that you normally would with yeah. any kind of variance, because it's usually always about setback, right? It's or lot coverage, or both. And so I think that's where you need to you, you need to focus. And I realize it's hard to do that without the complete right. picture, but you've got a floor plan. <coughs> you've got a footprint. You've got a footprint. You've got a site plan. That should be enough for you. Yeah. And you've got some elevation. So you, right. you sh in pictures. So you should... You should be able to kind of tell I don't know that enough. That, that should be in their packets. I think it's it in your description, all those yeah. same exact dimensions. You know, I don't think that from a, from a dimensional perspective, I don't know why you would need more information than what's presented. The question is, can you understand the, the information that's presented? Because it is complicated and there's so many, so many angles to it. The, the thing to me that you bring up that, that helps me uh, again, I, I, it's, it's, does the property reason, uh, a reasonable return? Well, the reasonable return to me is the fact that it allows you to be able to then use the, the new standards to improve the, the neighborhood. And it, so to, to me, on its face, without anything at all, I would come back and typically say, if, if you want to raise it, raise it, that I get that, put the, get it up to height, that would cause uh, the property to be more safe and standard and usable and all those things. And, but I would have a problem with the infill, right? Yeah, in a traditional sense. So where I, so I would say, you know, if as long as you do that, I think you've hit the trigger. For me personally, other board members are going to have a different opinion on that. I know that. The the what gives me more ability to breathe, I guess. To, to be willing to look at the expansion comes back to what um, Mr. Longstaff is saying, which is it allows him to now be able to do his job right and gives him more flexibility to make the property more consistent with what the town is looking for. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it'll be easier to meet the character study. I'm yeah, that's, him not, answer that. that's not really, <laughs> that's not really <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm, I'm just trying to help the board get to a point where they can feel comfortable about a decision on this variance appeal, okay? I haven't said anything about whether, whether any of this meets any of the criteria. That's where the rubber hits the road. Right. I'm just trying to help you sort through the many different facets of this particular ask, okay? Because it's got dimensional stuff, it's got infill stuff, it's got a roof thing, and. It, it, it basically, if you boil it down, it's the roof, it's the changing of the roof pitch on a non-conforming structure, which is a vertical expansion. Take, don't even consider the elevating of the structure, which has to take place because of substantial improvement. Okay, so that that's one piece of it, and maybe maybe the major piece of it. The infill stuff, I'm sure they would love to have it. I'm still not 100% convinced that the addition on the, if you're looking at the house from the street side on the left side, DP, that, that kind of falls in DEP's dune regulations. It doesn't really concern me so much from, uh, it, it's not a shoreland zone issue and it's not, uh, other than it's an expansion of the nonconformity because the building doesn't meet setbacks. Aside from that, I have no problem with that I'm not convinced that DEP doesn't have a problem with that, but Travis and, and, uh, and the owners weren't able to get a clear answer from DEP on whether or not they object to that infill, that bigger infill. 
Nobody has a problem with the infill on the porch uh, where the porch steps are because that's already covered with impervious surface. Oh, okay. okay. So, so from everybody else, all the other agency perspectives, that's not an issue. Again, it's an issue for us because our definition of nonconformity doesn't allow the infill aspect. But it is already impervious. But it is already impervious. So, but, but you know, all, having said all of that, when you get back to criteria one, why does any of this has to have to happen? And that's actually the next that's, question. That's the big one. That's what, the question. What precipitated this? They, they want to up, they want to, it's not insulated, they want to make it, they want to do improvements to it um, by elevating it to, for the for the floodplain, and they're allowed to expand it. Uh, it I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, if you'd like to, to take the microphone, you're welcome to. We just can't hear you. Feel free to go up. Yeah, they want, they, because they're allowed to expand it by 30%, then they can get more bedroom spaces out of it. Well, well, the challenge is that because we're in a variant situation, they're not necessarily allowed to do the 30% in the way that they're trying to do it. So the, the challenge is that we're variants. And, and let me read the variants. And this is why right. how you word things is very important. And, and that's why you may want to jump into it, okay? Because th th it's very important. And it's a very hard item to meet. And it causes a lot, they are usually declined. The land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Reasonable return does not mean maximum return, the 30%. Applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not granted. Reasonable return is not determined by personal circumstances of the applicant. That's a state law, okay? So what we're reading is a state law. It's triggered because you're in a shoreland zone. Otherwise, you'd be dropping, you'd be dropping into a, a much lesser category, which is easier to meet. The answer that's on the paper here, in my opinion, doesn't even come close to meeting that. And if it were just the words on this writing, I don't think you even come close, and I'll read it. While it is true that reasonable return can be acquired, a variance is sought because we feel the potential value increase of the property should be based upon the zoning of adjacent properties, which we cannot meet because of the unique lot size. The unique circumstances are based upon the actual building lot and not by the personal preferences of the owners or the architect. At face value, if you're going with that position, I don't think you come close to meeting that, which means you can't meet anything else, and it would be a decline in my opinion, if the board all agreed with me, or three of the board members. So the challenge that we've got is, <clears throat> I think all of us want to do the right thing by it if it's physically possible and legally possible. I think the town would prefer to have what's being done, but the state regulations are different than that. And so my concern for you, based on how this is presented, it's just it the wording of that. Well, it's not the wording of that. It, it's, it's um, I'll give you, again, this is not the right format, but, but yeah, the other best at this. So. <laughs> um, I, I think what we normally look for in something like this is we're looking for reasons as to why something has to happen to the structure. Yep. Like, we've had people come in where there's been mold in attics. We've had people come in where the electrical system is not up to code, needs to be upgraded. There are potential stairways going up to the second floor if this has a second floor that don't meet code. So there's a lot of different variables that we can then look at it and say, okay, this precipitated the change, and without doing this, it can't, re it can't generate a reasonable return. So we get proof like electrical or plumbing or roof. We've had some people that have built roofs over roofs, and <laughs> the right, sub roof right. has been all deteriorated and molded. So I think that's what we're trying to ask, and the, really the way you've answered this is it can yield a reasonable return. Any, any piece of land can yield a reasonable return. We need, we need some more information as to why. If this is just being done for personal preference, it's not going to fly. Right, right. Just if you could just state your name and address, that would be great. My name is Karen Haskell. I'm from Portland, and uh, the wife of Dave Haskell is one of the owners of the property. Okay. Um, 
the roof on our cottage is in bad shape. It is rotting, and we've had leakage for the past two years, and we've repaired it the best we can. There's an old fireplace and chimney original to the cottage that has, uh, is now cannot be used. The mortar is powder. It's falling down. Uh, so there are some very serious repair, repairs that need to be done to the cottage. As we think about what, what that requires, we obviously, if we're going to put money into the cottage, it would make a lot of sense to winterize it so that perhaps we have a, a longer season there. Uh, it hasn't been winterized. Very little has been done to the cottage since that garage floated out from a storm and we put it back and connected it to the house. Um, that's an, could you repeat that? Because that's an important piece of the puzzle. I didn't know about that. Pardon me? I didn't read about that. About the garage washing away. Uh, in 1978, there was a bad storm, and mm -hmm. that garage, which we have, we have photos of what that property looked like to show you. Um, the garage was not attached to the house the way it is now. There was a little walkway from what I understand. And that was a garage, there was a driveway when the property was bought by Sarah and David's grandfather, I think in 1945. 46. So that actually the got storm, to the point the storm where the washed the garage into the street, and when they brought it back, they then connected it to the cottage to make uh, two bedrooms and a loft. And other than that, there's been very little. We've replaced windows, but there's been very little done to the cottage over the years. So consequently, things are out of plumb. We do know the roof is in desperate need of being repaired or replaced. Uh, and again, the brick structure is, is crumbling down around us. So in going through the consideration for doing those improvements, yes, we wanted to enhance the value of the cottage, not only for the people, for us that own it today, but ultimately for anybody else that might own it. As you know, that with our location on the beach, if a storm ever washes that that cottage away, it can't, you know, only a storm would allow somebody to rebuild there. So we'd like to, to firm it up as much as we can. It's built with two by fours. There's no insulation. It's literally, the, the walls are just the, the construction walls. Um, and it's lower than it should be. So if a big bad storm comes along, we could lose that cottage. So all of those things, I think, combined are what are, is prompting the desire to make improvements to the property. Is there any basement right now? Pardon me? Is there any basement right now? No. No, it's on pilings. So when, when, when was that? You had said that they reattached the house. We're going to have to have to go back over there. You, you had said they had attached the house, the garage to the house. When, what year was that done? The storm was in 78, Dave. It was attached the same year. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that was the storm. Yeah, that, was that was in April, wasn't it? That doesn't get us anything. Is it February? I can't remember. Mr. Longstaff, that doesn't get us into anything but where the sales? result of action taken by, yeah. by the owner to put it into attaching those two things, it doesn't get us into that, does it? I'm back then. <coughs> not sure. I'm just looking at the result of an action taken by the previous owner when they attached it and put it into I'm custom. having a hard time with this picture figuring out <laughs> what about this is what we're like looking that? at now. <laughs> <laughs> that looks nothing, that's not, to me, it doesn't even look like the same half. <laughs> and the angle is uh, off. That, I, I, I'm, having, I'm having trouble orienting myself, so it's hard for me to, to comment. Right, that's because the only photos we have of it back then is from the ocean side, mm -hmm. and you're comparing it probably with the street side. Here's, I'm going to throw something off the board here. Normally what we expect is documentation and you know, we've we've gone through quite a bit of detail. We've actually, in my opinion, coached. I have coached a little too much on the board. I don't think it's our job to coach a thing. I do believe that there may, there is a reasonable chance that this could fly if it were presented in a way that was not about the design, but rather about the requirements of a variance appeal. But isn't that and the question? I could hold you, sir. So based on the fact that really this hasn't been looked at as a variance appeal, but rather as a design issue, my personal opinion is it should be tabled to get the proper documentation to deal with this as a variance appeal as opposed to a design appeal. Because as Mr. Longstaff said, all of the other stuff's irrelevant. But we don't, all we have is the stuff that's irrelevant. 
we don't have the meat which says this house needs to either carry its weight or not. That's what concerns me is there's no evidence. I mean, we appreciate what you said, but there's no evidence. I feel like in other appeals that they present evidence saying our house is rotted. We've done an inspection. Here's an inspection. Mm -hmm. This is the Picture. five that you need to yeah. do this. We see pictures of the roofs showing the rot or the boards coming apart or the roof physically deteriorating. Oftentimes people have the fire department go out and take a look at it, find out if the electrical is up to code and let us know. I don't know if you have a heating source in there. So, I mean, these are the type of things that we really need to make a determination on. But I would second the chair's request right, so to table. So I'm going to move to table. It's second. That's non-debatable. We've got a second. Uh, this uh, move to table is non-debatable, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I'd just like to make one statement. Um, I think there's probably about 12 houses on shipwreck, and every single one of those houses, other than there's probably two or three of them that have been rebuilt in recent years, raised up, uh, all those houses are pretty much in the same condition as the Haskell's houses. They're old houses, they're on these tiny little lots, um, and they've never been able to be rebuilt primarily because of the zoning regulations. Uh, it's been impossible for anybody to rebuild. And when the new zoning came in, the, it was hoped that these houses there's little strange lots here and there all along the, the beach that they could be included and they could be uh, made so that they could be rebuilt and improved like all the other cottages. So, I mean, this is, this is the first one that's coming to us, but I just want you to know that there's going to be about eight or ten more that are going to be coming and they're going to be the same type. So we ought to give a lot of thought to how we want to handle these things. I agree. That's yeah. why we have to get it right on the very first one. And so, um, Well, that's why I'd, I'd hate to see it tabled. You get declined if it's not tabled. I'll tell you right now. Right. Well, because part of this is reasonable return. It's you like might, you might all have, these you houses. Missed, you might have missed what I just said. What? If you don't table, you'll probably get declined. Okay. You've, in your writing, said that it meets a reasonable return. So my advice is very strong, and it's not debatable anyway. I don't even know what we debate. can't change that. I'd like to move to table. It's been tabled. Second. All in favor of tabling? That's unanimous. Thank you. If you would like, I'm more than willing to talk with you after the fact. I don't mind the time. I don't want you to go down in flames for the wrong reasons. Right. You wouldn't be able to come back for a year, and I have no desire to see anybody get hurt. But that, that's where that sits. So this has been tabled. Would you like to come back next meeting, or yes. would you want to go? So we'll put you first on the agenda for next meeting. Okay. We really and, need that information, proof, uh, pictures. That's you can get doing. a lot of information from, from Mr. Lundstedt. I spent a lot of time. I right. think all of the items that you've presented are great, but it doesn't apply to what we have to deal with. Right. And, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Karen, are we keeping this? Yeah. That would be would great. You know? Okay. So. Or, or I can take it. Either. How, how please, about I? Please return them to Karen. Yes. If you don't want to keep them, because we'll use them when they come back. Just write your name on it, and I'll put it back. <laughs> you can take it home with you if you would like. Oh, thank you. you can bring it back. I'll keep it. Or I can bring it. I'll keep it. I'll keep it in my pocket, too. Because then you're fine with it? Yes. I know you're fine with keeping it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And Mark, I just put them right in my pocket. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the, uh, I'm going to do my paperwork here. Board, I apologize if I spoke too strongly for the board on that. I just, uh, I just know, I know you guys. <laughs> so oh, I think you probably, probably hold me, rein me back in a little. Well, it was, it was right there on the first comment. It, it said that it could. So, I mean, how can we improve yeah. it if it says yeah. that it can? <laughs> Very first question. Yeah, I wasn't reading his response on that. There it is. The last two of the night. 
You're welcome. Uh, it's <laughs> number 2588. It's a practical and difficulty variance uh, appeal by Stephen Lynch, 14 Pearl Street. So it's map U2, uh, parcel 84. I have to be honest with you, I was a little bit confused by this one too, so I'll probably be lying on Brian a lot on this one here, but uh, welcome. <laughs> if you Thank state you. your name right, uh, address, that'd be great. Walter Wilson from Design Company, and I'm representing Steve Lynch for 14 Pearl Street and his application to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a practical difficulty of variance. And as I said in the letter, where you're also looking for a review of the CDCR1 section for a placement of a carriage house on the property as well. Um, and uh, I do have plans, although I had figured we'd have the TV monitor so I didn't bring in any backer board to put them on the easel way. So, um, we, can, we can help you out with that. You think so? Yeah, we'll take a second to do that. Um, also, It'll help me find where the CDR1 section of this is. Because what, my understanding, Mr. Wilson, is you're looking at kind of two moving targets, right? One is the the house and the other is the carriage house. That isn't there. All right. I can put that in there first, yes. I got a couple of clips too. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, what did you say? I, I, my understanding is we're looking at two different events. One is well, the, basically we're looking at one one event on the practical difficulty variance in relation to the house. But the you, other is kind of a a qualification about a, a location based on the character code that I talked to Brian about, and he he said the thing to do is bring it up to the board to see if what you propose to do is within the character code and zoning. Re requirements that we have okay. so it's kind of like separate from the from the variance for the house if it is allowed to go there it, it it doesn't have to meet any other requirements other than the character code and the setback okay. so we we'll get into that as we go along that that, that yeah. was a little confusing to me and it should have a cd1 i think right yes the coastal residential it doesn't <laughs> Now, just for the public's knowledge, this is all, uh, both of these are kind of new opportunities for the town to have uh, better management of and more control over help, helping people get to a better place for their properties. But at the same time, it, it, it is totally new as far as the process to the board. And as you noticed in the last appeal, the issues that were being brought forward were not the issues that were relevant to what the board's requirements are. And that's why we tabled that. And so we're kind of in the same situation here, but uh, Mr. Wilson's going to It, it has it some well. similarities, but it is a little different. Yeah, and it's and a different appeal level, too, where this is a practical difficulty as opposed to a variance. Right, exactly. So Mr. Now, Wilson, I'll let you have the floor. Okay. So this property contains about 4,982 square feet with an existing residence. The central portion of this house was built in the 19th century, and actually, from checking with the owner, it goes back to 1860, as far as they can tell. And it's probably the oldest building, if not the original building, that was brought into Higgins Beach way back when. So there is a little history, uh, history significance to the building. It was Did brought, brought in. in? Did, you mm -hmm. Did you say brought in? It was in? brought in, and I'm um, mentioning what it was. What it is, it, it was an old photographer's wagon that he used to bring around and take photo uh, pictures in. And the original living, the original structure is the living room of this floor plan with the curved top ceiling still in place. And when they originally brought it in, it was predating Higgins Beach subdivision, roadways, and everything else that was placed there. And when all the subdivision and property line stuff came about, when they did it, they didn't take any particular uh, care as to what was already there, and they just drew the lines on a piece of paper, and as such, he ends up close to the rear property line. And um, it sits back considerable distance from Pearl Street, because that's just the way when the roads were laid out on the, on the uh, plot plan, they didn't take consideration of where any buildings were, evidently. 
So that's why this ended up being there. Now, when this house did have a couple of additions put on over the years, they actually found old photo uh, photographic photos of Civil, Civil War soldiers and stuff that the guy had taken. So we know it dates back to Civil War time. Um, it has been added to a couple times, uh, three times maybe, and uh, over the years. And actually a floor has been put up on the second floor, which goes over the top of the original wagon that was in there. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The existing front of the house is about 64 and a half feet in from Pearl Street. And they want to put an addition to the front of the house. That triggers a setback because a variance because under the regulations of the new ordinance that we've been talking about, the character ordinance, it says that the front yard setback of a building must be between 18 foot minimum and 21 foot maximum. And even with the addition on there, we're still going to be 47 feet from Pearl Street, which is further in than what the new zoning allows for a front yard setback. So. But you're still within the building envelope. Still within the building envelope that's allowed because the building envelope is the dotted line on the site plan it shows there. And the new ordinance does not have a maximum square footage. As long as you build within the envelope, you're okay. Uh, the whole addition to the front is within the building envelope. So the whole front addition that we're looking to add on creates a variant requirement because they're too far back from Pearl Street. So and like most, most front yard setbacks, you have to be a minimum 20 feet or whatever, and if you're further back than that, you're okay. So I just want to make sure I understand this. I, I, I don't know if we should wait for Brian to come back or not. Um, my understanding is, so from a practical point of view, if the new ordinance hadn't gone into effect, you'd just build that and you would have no, you'd have no problem. Exactly as far as the addition to the front of the building goes. Everybody agree with that? Yes. Just build a walkway all the way out till you hit it. And I mean, I, I mean to, me, to me, the the realities of the property kind of make that an easy jump. Yeah. As long as everybody agrees that you could build that in the building envelope, it would look kind of silly, you know, putting a little tube out there to get to the point where you meet the requirements. It's the way they wrote the new ordinance. It says that all front of the main part of a, uh, of a building has to have a setback of no less than 18 feet and no more than 21 feet from the property line and the street line. And so it refers primarily when they wrote the code, and like Brian was saying too, it refer is referenced that way because if you tear down an existing building and build a new one, the front wall of the building, you get that three foot leeway and that's it. And the idea was to create houses closer to the street, which I understand. But in this case, we'd have to build an addition that went out to the street another 40 feet that would only be about 15 feet wide to make it conform to the front yard setback, which would be kind of not practical, <laughs> to put it the least. So we're proposing a, an addition in the front, which is a little over 16 feet off the front of the house. Um, <coughs> as well as that, oh, I'm going around the other side. Come on. Were you working? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is the existing building right here. And we're proposing to put this front addition on at this point in the front. And we need the setback, like I said, variance. On this side of the building, there's a couple wood decks and an a, a extension on this side right here of the house. What we want to do, and I can explain it in the middle, in a minute, is on this wall, we want to extend out two feet with an infill right there. But that's really not infill because it's deck already there? Yeah, it'd be over where the deck is. Okay. Yeah. And so that comes over with <coughs> already all deck. So we got, it's already, in a, it's already in an impervious area. And where this little, what I call an attached shed is, is attached to the building with a roof on it. There's a little four by four area right in here that we want to take an infill back over there already. So this infill that takes place right in here is already over the existing wood decks. 
Okay. Uh, the reason we're doing me, that. Can, if I can stop you there for a second, I just want to make sure Brian's up to speed. And uh, if I, I just want to make sure Brian's up to speed. Okay. And I also have a couple questions for him. So what we're hearing is that the new rules going into effect create the need for this piece here to come before us, even though it's in the envelope. Right, because it doesn't meet the front setback of 18 to 21 feet. And also, so the back of the building does not meet the rear setback of 30 feet. So it's an existing non-conforming, legally non-conforming building, but by placing this addition on the front, this is your this is your front <laughs> setback. It can't quite meet it. It's a pipe. Yeah, yeah I, it, <laughs> it's the lot configuration is so, you know, so different, very unique, and. So there's so much unique, so many unique aspects to it that this, even though this, if this was all moved forward, this would be fine. Yeah. This would probably not be a front addition, it would be a rear addition, but it's just all backwards. <laughs> so, so I guess my, my question is, and, and jump in guys, and anybody on the board, jump in. My thought is on this addition in the front, I'm not sure we really have a problem with that because it's new regulations. This just doesn't. The practical difficulty is that the placement of the original building it doesn't make sense to go out. It, there's nowhere to add on but in the front, but you still can't. And it's in the envelope. Here. Does anybody have a real ulcer over any of that? Because then we can look at the stuff that might matter. Because I, I just don't see that as being. I know it's relevant, and I know we have to address it. I was going to say. Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I could, yeah. it, you may not have a problem with it, but you still have to go back to the criteria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't, you can't just sort of leapfrog <laughs> over that. But but I understand what you're saying, and that that's I think that's fine. But but yeah, we got to still go back and tie it to the criteria. Which is, and to me, the, the greater issue is this little in, again infill, and but that's on a deck, and that's just changing shed over. So we're not again trying to be consistent with the fact that we're not expanding the 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 footprint is what I'm trying to get a handle on mm -hmm. on this section here. Again, I, I realize we have to meet that front part, but and I think you can. I, I, I'm not too worried about it. But right, this is this is much like the last appeal, and that it's an expansion of a non-conforming structure in this area because this is the this is the permitted building envelope. The building never was there. <laughs> it's, it's been there. So any any little, no matter how much sense it makes from an architectural standpoint, it's still expanding the nonconformity. But unlike the last appeal, this is a practical difficulty rather than a hardship variance. So the criteria changes, and you just look at that. And and, and, and this is filling in area that's already um, most of it's covered it. by a roof. I guess I guess you could say that, yeah. or at least a piece of it's covered by the roof. You want me take a minute, I can explain why we need the two foot inside. Go right ahead. Okay. On, uh, page, on page two of what I did, which is the existing building layout, there's a little cross section on the right side. And you'll see that the building wall height is five foot nine inches at that point on the inside of the house. And there's a look, the, it shows the open rafter coming down, which was the original shed roof that went over that extension, which has a five foot nine height to it. The second floor, coming off the top of the uh, old uh, uh, wagon, comes straight across. And what we want to do, and that, that extension is two feet, by the way, from the first floor side wall to the second, steps in two feet. And what we want to do shows up on um, page um, number four. You'll see on page four there's another cross section on that right hand side. It shows the extension of that wall going out two feet. And in doing that, I can run the second floor level out to the top of that wall to create the wall to seven foot eight inches high instead of five foot nine. So that little two foot extension allows us to get a seven foot nine inch, a seven foot eight inch or nine inch wall 
in place of the five foot nine wall and rebuild the little shed roof that goes the length of that infill. So we can make the first floor a usable floor. The remaining part of the house and that is the uh, the whole first floor on the remaining part of the house. Once we get this two foot infill approved on the side, this all stays the same other than the rearrangement of the bathroom. Um, this bathroom we're pulling this wall into for you. And having a hard time holding the reading up. Okay. So this is what we're talking about, is that two feet right here on the side, and take the existing shed roof and bring it out over the two feet. Keeping in mind that this two feet already extends over all the outside wood deck in the previous area that's already there. So once we do that, we put the addition on the front of the house. The second floor, roof line and everything stays exactly the way it is. There's no change to the structure at all. The only change to the structure is going to be the addition of the front and that little shed roof over that two-foot extension on the first floor. The main house stays the way it is. Um, Walter, what did you say about the bathrooms moving in? Yeah, right now... <coughs> got to borrow your fingers, Grant. Right now, this is the side we're going with the two-foot infill on. This extension right here, where the bathroom is now, goes out ten and a half feet. Okay? And what we want to do is pull that in two feet. So what happens is, please, On this page four, you'll see that dotted line right there, and it says two foot to be removed. That's okay. that existing one we're going to pull back two feet. And then incorporate that existing shed area with a new way of getting into the bathroom with a washer and dryer. So those are the basic two things we're looking at. The, the, the second floor of the house, This front being the addition, this is the existing house, and the only change for changing some windows up here to get egress windows in, which don't exist now. The back of the house, no change whatsoever, except we're pulling that in two feet on the left side. That's that extension we're pulling back two feet. And there's no change there, because all this is in the front of the house, which is the piece way up here. So when you're standing in the back and looking at it, you see that, but that's way in the front. The back of the house, the roof lines, everything stay exactly like they are. There's no change. So between the between the additional expansion for the two foot overhang, and and the um, the two feet that you're taking away on the bathrooms, what's the difference? Uh, we're taking away two foot by twelve foot, and we're adding two foot by fourteen eight. A couple of feet then, okay. And right now. On that existing house, because that wall is only five foot, seven or eight inches high, that door that goes out this wall right here is only five foot, four inches high in height, the exterior door. Um, let me show you a little comparison. that side where I'm talking about the shed, we want to pull it back two feet. It's got a sawtooth roof on it. And what we want to do on a sawtooth roof is there's the back of the roof. Instead of sawtooth, just come down with a roof cover on it, make it look like a traditional gable roof. So we'd have to infill the top of that roof and infill that two-foot projection on the side. And 
would get a look like this with a new addition in the front and the front of the house looking like this with a gambrel type in the front porch versus what it looks like now. It goes from, it goes from that look to this look. But all this still stays there because all this is in front of that. So this whole roof shape and everything stays except for that little infill we're doing on that. But I tried to explain. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. What, what persists? Yeah. What initiated the change to be made? What, what is, what is the reasoning for um, doing all of this? The house is in need of repair. The inside of the house, there's a lot of non-conformity. For example, the interior stairway that goes up to the second floor, inside the walls is two foot wide. And there's steep stairs going up. Back 100 years ago or more, 150 years ago, when they did that. They didn't have uh, rules. The windows, none of them be egress windows in any of the bedrooms upstairs at all. The wall heights are all short, uh, necessitating short doors, like in this case, a little above five foot high in the height of the door. And the owner wants to use this more year round than what this has been over the generations. Even though they've lived in here year round quite a bit, it's been tough because of the fact that the headroom heights, especially on what they call the kitchen, which has that five foot nine inch wall in it, uh, with a sloping ceiling. And it doesn't have a laundry room. There's no bedroom on the second, a bathroom on the second floor. There's four bedrooms on the second floor, but you gotta go through one bedroom to get to the other one. Um, and like I say, none of the windows meet egress. So in, <coughs> in the kitchen is, there's a counter with a sink and a refrigerator tucked in one wall and a stove tucked down and there's not enough room to do anything as far as living like you normally think you're living in a kitchen. So the addition part going on the front, is that why you're looking to do the addition is because you're looking to do a, a suitable kitchen? So the, the part that goes done. on the front is for the kitchen, a coat, a stairway going up to the second floor, bathrooms on the second floor, and a rearrangement of the bedrooms to, to be more usable and practical. And you can't. Now, all this takes place within the existing structure. We aren't raising the roof there or anything. I just need to step over. Only we're doing the change for us in the front. Mr. Wilson, I just have to step out for a minute. This vice chair is going to take over while I step out for a minute. So continue, okay? Excuse me. And there's no feasible way to do what you're looking to do in the footprint of the property because of the dimensions and the sizes, is what I'm hearing. And also that when we go back to the existing building, we're doing a lot of we'd be doing a lot of work within the 30 foot setback. And so this keeps everything forward of the 30 foot rear yard setback, with the exception of that little two foot infill that I talked about, which is over the existing deck. But you're offsetting on that in other parts of the yes. house. By reducing this square footage and adding that square footage. Pretty close to the same. Okay. You think that's a good question? No, not yet. So that's why hey. we're in here. All right. Any, any other questions from the board? Brian, do you have anything to add on that? Um, again, I'll, I'll refer to my staff comments. Um, th this is, in some ways, as, as Walt, as Mr. Wilson already said, it, it's sort of similar to the last appeal in certain ways, different in other ways. It's a little complicated, made complicated by the fact of, that the, the existing structure is a legally existing non-conforming structure with regard to the current setbacks for, for the uh, coastal residential zone. Um, as I said, if you kind of, if you flip the back of the lot to the front and the front of the lot to the back, he'd be looking at a 
it, it would still be non-compliant because it would be too close to the front property line, but the, the, the front addition that he's proposing would now be a rear addition and probably would be compliant at that point in something they could, could do without a variance. Sure. Um, there are a few, again, much like the last appeal, you want to be careful as you're considering the relief requests, are you looking at dimensional or space and bulk type relief, or are they asking for actual character code element type relief? And I bring that up because I don't know how married um, the owner and Mr. Wilson are to the Gambrell roof uh, structure on the front, but the Gambrell roof is not a permitted design in the, in the new code. There's, if you look in the, in the ordinance, under all of the roof types, Gambrell is not listed. So that's not a permitted element. So if, if we were just to review this, if it was compliant in every other way and they were pr to propose this, we'd probably have them go back to the drawing board on the Gambrell roof. Are they asking for relief for the Gra Gambrell roof? I don't believe they are, but it's being shown on the plans. It, so that's, it's those little character elements that, as I say, I, I don't know how, how married you are to that design or if there's any <laughs> flexibility there. If there isn't, and you know there isn't, I would suggest that the applicant at this time <laughs> build that into their request for relief for you to consider. And as you consider that, you want to refer back to the code and say, well, does that meet the practical difficulty criteria? Is a Gambrell roof facade that they're proposing, is there no feasible alternative, for example? Okay. Um, on one of my answers, I think answer two, I made a little reference to that. And I said that um, dealing with the un uh, not producing undesirable change in the neighborhood, character of the neighborhood, the last sentence I get in there says the proposed alterations and additions will also be subject to administrative review to determine the uh, compliance with the Higgin Beach Character Code. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking for a design approval here. Okay. I'm looking for a space and bulk. So you are concentrating on relief from the space and bulk thing. Right. And I, I just bring that up because these things sort of cross paths and yeah. it, it can get complicated for the board members to, to determine just what are we what are we reviewing here? Yeah, the space in the way, of meeting. The way I looked at it. Yeah, and um, um, like I was saying, the addition in the front it meets the side yard setbacks and all that. It's just the front yard relief for space mm -hmm. and bulk, and the little two foot addition on the side, the fill in if you want to call it that. That's in the thirty foot setback, so that's just a space and bulk variants we're asking for to get relief from the inadequate height that's in the building on that side to solve a structural problem. And if it weren't for the fact that that's in the 30-foot setback, it would still meet the width requirements for the, right. the minimum maximum width requirements. Right, exactly. So, so we aren't looking for any... That's just because it's too far back on the lot. Just to bring Mr. Chair up to speed, um, Mr. Longstaff had mentioned that the Gambrell roof is not permitted under the new zone down there and it's showing a Gambrell roof on it, but they're not asking for that in, in the design. That's something that could be changed. You yeah. know, more for the space. Thanks for well, that's you. something I want to talk to with Brian quite a bit about. <laughs> about the, the, we have the, specific the colors that we prefer. The main roof of the house is not a Gambrell, by the way. Right. It's, it's just that little two-foot extension yeah. in the front that puts the shape on it. The main roof of the house is a straight two-story gable roof. So essentially, you're, you're, con you're really the main part of the house for the changes you're looking at. You're staying primarily within the footprint because you're taking two feet off here, two feet off there, and adding e another two foot. E even without right. doing that. Even without got it, we don't the, have the front portion is all within the window, within the within the envelope. It's just it's the it's outside the envelope that that he has. He's, they're reducing one section by two feet and increasing another by two feet. Right. And it's the square footage. It's about another five feet, about four four to five feet. Uh, yeah. Is and, all they're adding. And under the new ordinance on the character, there is no 
maximum square footage of lot coverage that's allowed in this. You can put any lot coverage you want as long as you're within the building envelope. So it's not a matter of swapping square footage for one thing for another because that doesn't come into play. Um, the reason we need that, like I say, is the wall's only five foot nine. I've got to create a structural deficiency in the building in order to make it a livable room. But the front addition is basically because of the fact that you can't build anything for a feasible kitchen with that space that you have due to the wall space and exactly. the constraints exactly. there. That's why you're coming forward with a new kitchen. With a new kitchen, with uh, standard wall heights, a, a uh, code compliance stairway getting up to the second floor. and um, Any other uh, issues, electrical, oh yeah. plumbing? Oh yeah, all that. <laughs> <laughs> Roofing, <laughs> all that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's problems with, the, with electrical, with plumbing. Uh, there's no washer and dryer in there. There's uh, um, only one bedroom in the whole house, and that's in that back corner. Is there any 220 hookup for? Excuse me. Is there any 220 hookup for? I believe there is a 220 for a stove. Yes. Sure. Um, so let's do this. Let's open it up to the public. Anybody wish to speak to us on the public? Yes. So if you could state your name and address, that would be great. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Mark Fury. Um, my year-round address is 21 Sheffield Street, Portland, Maine, 04102. I own property at 13 Ocean Avenue, Higgins Beach, Scarborough, Maine. The project that is <clears throat> on display before you butts up against my backyard. Basically, my rear line... If you want to grab the microphone that's handheld there, feel free. You can see he's, is this working? Yep. He's going to flip it over to see if it's on, sorry, on the bottom. No, no, it's the other way. No, no, you're fine. It sounds like it's on. There we go. I don't think it was on for Walt the whole time he was talking. <laughs> well, let's start again. <laughs> oh, no. The now or formerly Mark G. Fury. I am the now and formerly Mark G. Fury. This is, uh, this is my lot and the Lynch lot, which is the project under proposal. Uh, the line is there. Uh, in general, you can say that the setback is either non-existent, that is the, the cottage, the Lynch cottage is uh, uh, right on the line, or it's set back in some cases six inches, maybe a foot. There's a propane tank that the Lynches have that is over the line onto my property. I'm not here because of that. Uh, there's an entryway to their cellar that is over the line onto my property. I'm not here for that. But I mention those because I need the board to understand that this is really close to uh, my backyard. In effect, it's practically in my backyard. And uh, from the homeowner's point of view, setback is meant to guarantee uh, privacy and peace and quiet. And I don't have any. The, the lynches have over 30 feet of setback from my property, but I basically have nothing from theirs. Under the guise of asking for a zoning ordinance uh, variance, the proposal is to, I think, by my calculations, double the size of the Lynch Cottage, double the size of the building that is located six inches from my property. Now, I think I'm entitled to uh, privacy and peace and quiet, and in my experience, if you double the size of a cottage, you double the activity at that cottage, you double the number of barking dogs, the number of uh, loud stereos, uh, and everything of that nature. So my major reason for opposing this is because I do not want this uh, non-conforming structure to be doubled uh, under the guise of getting an ordinance uh, for the front of the building. The net effect of all of this is if you grant the variance, the size of this building, which is located six inches from my property, is going to double, and I don't think that's fair. Thank you, sir. Some people may have some questions. So, uh, I, I have it 
Should I answer questions now, or uh, we'll, see, we'll see if anybody else would like to speak? You can yeah. you can leave that on. But you, you might just want to stay nearby. Yes. Yeah. Did I get it on? Yeah. And again, if you could just state your name and address. Yeah. Should I speak into this mic? Either, either, either one. one. Um, I'm Allison Eckert. My permanent address is 8 Tanager Lane, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I own the adjoining property to Steve, uh, along with my sister, at 12 Pearl Street. So. If you're looking at this property, we're one street, uh, one house down toward the water. Um, our house is real close to Steve's now, but I'm here to support his request for the addition. I think um, probably we're considerably more affected by the addition than um, the previous speaker is, um, because this will, you know, come out closer to, not really closer to our house, but more, it has more visual impact on our house. But I think, um, I completely understand why this is an important thing to do. The house is not in good repair. Um, Steve's been a great neighbor. Um, both of these properties have been in our families for a number of years. Uh, we care very much about the physical environment and the neighborhood feel. So. Um, I just feel that Steve's um, got a good plan. Walter's gonna, done a great job with all of the plans, and um, I just want to support this design as it's proposed. Thank you. And again, somebody may have some questions, so if you want to just stay nearby. Anybody else wants to speak? You don't have to stand up. You can just sit down if you'd like, but just stand up. Well, I have more to say. If that's, that's fine. Good night. Sure. Let, let's let the next gentleman speak, and then you can come back. If you name an Thank you. My name is Stephen Lynch, um, and I just want to very briefly say um, that I believe the board has received um, a letter from Allison, and thank you, Allison, kind words, and also a letter from the neighbor on the other side of my house. Uh, so Allison's here. Uh, you see a letter of support from my neighbor here, and a letter of support from my neighbor across the street, three most substantially impacted neighbors to, to what I'm proposing. And just one other thing, if it would be helpful, maybe you have this, the most recent survey, um, I'll give it to you, um, you know, it's a few months old, it shows the property line that Mr. Fury is talking about, and it documents that there's no encroachments of any sort at the moment. Thank you. Sir, sir, I just want to ask Mr. Wilson a question for what you had said earlier. If, if you could just come up and just answer a couple of quick questions I have. I, I don't see in the designs, and it seems to be a point of concern of the abutter, I don't see in the designs any place to relocate those stairs or the propane tank. Has, is that being addressed where they're so the close propane tank not over? will get shifted around, where relocated. Would, where would they be? And the, there isn't any stairs in the back. All it is is a scuttle hole in the foundation wall with a, with a door on it. You open up and you crawl into it. By moving that wing back to two feet, the anticipation is to have the access to the uh, basement on that end of the building now. So those doors would go away? The ones in the back would go away. They're only about uh, 18 inches high and 30 inches wide. I mean, they aren't, you wouldn't call them a door. It's a scuttle. And that's located on the back, right about behind the back of his shed right in here. This is a shed that the neighbor owns that comes right close to the line. And the scuttle access is right in here. That'll get turned around over on this side once we put the new foundation in. And we pull, we pull the old one out and put the new foundation in. We'll put the scuttle hole access in on that side. And where's the propane tank supposed propane to be? Propane tank is located right about in here right now. And where is it going to go? They'll probably go over the side over here. Uh, we're not sure yet. It's either going to be on the side here or over on the side here, and that may be determined when we talk about the other requests we want to be discussing okay. later on. And you're you're talking pouring foundation where it's kind of on the line. Are you going to have to encroach? That's the already there. There's this foundation under the under most of the house right now that was okay. done about 20 years ago. You said ago. you were going to have to pour some more foundation, didn't you? We'd have to take and. Uh, is on. 
Okay, we've got to put a new foundation underneath. It, it, it's it's off, off now. But right along here would require it's a not on. It's not on. Oh. <coughs> It was on. I turned it off. Okay. We have a new foundation going on in the front addition. And along this two-foot extension and the fill-in right here will be a new foundation going in because we're going to come out two feet. And on this side, we're going to pull that in two feet and put a new wall there. My concern about the foundation, though, is are you going to have to encroach this on... This is going to stay the way it is right now. I understand that. Are you going to have to encroach on the neighbor's land to get that foundation poured, or is that going to no. be... You're going to be able to come in on the current owner's land completely to, to get that foundation poured for the new foundation piece. Yeah, this piece right here, because if the wall comes out there now, we're just going to fill that in, do it all on, on, it on, on, the, the, on the property okay. itself. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be any encroachment no. going over in the neighbors. Okay, that's, that's the question I had for you. Okay. You. And, and the back of the house, like I said before, there's absolutely no change to the back of the house. This is exactly the way it is, except we're pulling that in two feet. This whole roof line of the house is exactly the way it is right now. We aren't changing it at all. So none of the stuff that we're talking about doing to the house has any effect for the neighbor in the rear. None whatsoever. Well, it seems like you're going to have an effect by taking things off from his property line. With the yeah, door. from that standpoint, yeah. Yeah, okay. From that standpoint. Mr. Flurry, feel free to, to speak to it. Is this on? Yes. In effect, what they're doing is they're bootstrapping uh, this cottage located virtually on my property line and saying because of that, we're entitled to double the size of our cottage. And to do that by asking for a variance on the front setback. So in effect, it's a variance. They're asking for a variance to double the size uh, of a cottage, and it doesn't really matter whether most of the increases in the size of the cottage are going to recur away from the property line. The point is the building, the contiguous building as a whole, when and if all this is over with, is going to be roughly twice the size. And that is uh, an impingement on uh, my privacy and, and my right to, to peace and quiet. I shouldn't have to I shouldn't have to deal with that. Uh, turning towards the ordinance, which I took a close look at, uh, and this is section five of our ordinance, uh, paragraph six, uh, practical difficulty variance. And under section B, there's a definition of practical difficulty, and it reads as follows. A case where strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. There's no preclusion of a use that is permitted in the zone. This is a single-family cottage. Now it will be a single-family cottage tomorrow. We're not, uh, it's not a true practical difficulty because it does not preclude a use that is permitted in the zone. Uh, in addition, there is no indication of any significant uh, economic hardship I was unclear on how the board would like to proceed, uh, but I would like to get certain documents in the record, and the first one has to do with uh, economic hardship. If I may, I'd present it to the chairman. It uh, does make it difficult when we get it at the last minute, but we'll take it. But the, the problem, I, I got notice of this on Thursday, last Thursday. Um, you should have been... You it was be. enough time, but I ha and I have a copy for copy of everything for the representative. But what this is is it's the ta it's the tax card for the for the Lynch property on the issue of economic hardship. There's no economic hardship. This property was appraised for two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. 
uh, not too long ago, and now it's appraised for $516,000. It is not a burden to own this property. Uh, there's no economic hardship, and I might say that uh, it's experienced the same degree of appreciation uh, that my own property has experienced. So I don't see that aspect of practical difficulty being met, and it's a single-family cottage now. It'll be a single-family cottage in the future. In the application for variance, uh, the applicant states that one of the reasons he needs a variance is because he has only 35 feet of frontage on Pearl Street. So as he goes closer to Pearl Street, in other words, into the proper setback zone, his lot is too narrow for a proper building. But the reason for that is because when the Lynches owned both lots, they changed um, they changed them so that the lot in the front, which is here, and it says now, now or formerly 16 Pearl Street Realty Trust. 16 Pearl Street Realty Trust is, in effect, uh, Mr. Lynch's sister. And what they did when the Lynch's owned this you lot... Know, just to challenge that, it, it doesn't matter what other properties are owned by whom or whatever. And, you, and you, if, you can stay on task on, and we're giving you a lot of leeway here with time, stay on task on the issues that you, you're concerned about with it. What, what I'm su suggesting, Mr. Chairman, is that the actions of a predecessor in interest created this problem. And under the practical difficulty statute uh, okay, so ordinance. So what, what part, explain what you mean by that. I, I cut you off, go ahead, explain your position. I'll, I'll Uh, under the ordinance, if the practical difficulty is caused, well, I'll, I'll read it because I finally found it here. Uh, the, the applicant has to establish, quote, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. And what happened here was the prior owner, who happened to be Mr. Lynch's father, uh, Richard Lynch, they owned these two lots and they decided to grant an extra 15 feet of frontage on Pearl Street for this lot, which is now uh, owned by the Realty Trust, which is... Okay. How, how does that trigger anything? It triggers a failure to comply with the, uh, with the ordinance because the practical difficulty it was caused by a predecessor in interest. Um, I, I, we're not going to debate with you on it, but okay. I, I'll, I'll discuss it a little bit. But continue going on. Your, your, I want to make sure you get everything on the record so you can be heard. So, so say what else you've got on, but I, I do want to address that afterwards. And I want to make sure that um, I want to make sure that the record is clear as to what uh, what I'd like to present. So and that's important. Uh, I researched title to these properties, and with the chair's permission, I would present exhibit number two, which is an excerpt from a will, and under that, uh, Richard Lynch uh, and his brother obtained this lot, which back then was called uh, Lot 67 on the old Higgins Beach plan, mm -hmm. which is plan book uh, 8, page 97. Exhibit number 3. That is when Richard Lynch acquired lot 66, which is basically the lot we're talking about. Many years later, After the death of Richard Lynch, the Richard P. Lynch Revocable Trust conveyed what amounts to Lot 67 to uh, Susan Langmore, his daughter, and 
Susan Langmore created the 16 Pearl Street Realty Trust and conveyed the property to that trust. Uh, but you will see when the property is coming out of the Lynch estate, rather than having 50 feet of frontage, which the lots originally had, that lot now has 65 feet of frontage. So what happened is lot 66 picked up an extra 15 feet of frontage in the rear, and in exchange for that, there's an extra 15 feet of frontage on Pearl Street for lot 67. And in the application, uh, they state that the unusual configuration of this lot is what prevents the Lynch property from moving off my sideline and up to Pearl Street, which so is where it belongs. So you're suggesting that they should move the entire property forward? What I'm suggesting is that uh, they haven't complied with the uh, requirements of the practical difficulty variance because one of the practical difficulties they're citing, which is 35 feet on, only 35 feet on Pearl Street, is in fact caused by uh, predecessor in interest, the well, father of... I don't know if you know this or not, but that, that ordinance is new. The ordinance that is triggering this is a brand new ordinance. I don't know if you're aware of that. Is well, I printed this two nights ago. Yeah, that's okay. That's what I'm just telling you. Okay. Um, what, so I'm just confused about what your point is. And, and if the board anybody else wants to jump in, feel free. But what I'm hearing you say is that because they deeded over part of the property, that's what's triggering the need for them to have to come forward to get the practical difficulty. It but triggers their need to have to allow them to build back from Pearl Street. Well, they would be allowed under normal circumstances to build in their building envelope no matter what. The existing building of an envelope, but if they couldn't, they have to build uh, uh, no, uh, 21 feet from Pearl Street. I mean, they the could build a longer building. You're correct. I mean, they could build a longer building under the new ordinance instead of just stopping at the point they're stopping, and that would meet the requirement of the... The, 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 the rule is kind of weird, and I, I'm not trying to take the wind out of yourself, and please correct me if I'm wrong, any of, everybody. The, the rule basically... This house doesn't fit the normal rules. What, what it's basically... The new rules that are in place are yes. saying we don't want houses set back from the road. We want them within a certain window, okay? So they, became, they came forward saying, we want to build this, but we don't want to go all the way up to that window. It's just going to be too big. They could do that and be in compliance with the ordinance and not have to be here. Is that correct? Without any other changes. Under the assumption we have no other changes. If they were to extend that, make it a frame in that, or in that footprint, and they brought it to the window that they need to be in, they wouldn't have to be here. Am I correct with that? Not exactly. What am I missing? <laughs> <laughs> Once again, because of the placement of the original structure, they wouldn't be conforming because they, they'll never meet the 30-foot rear setback. Okay, so the... No. What? We would be. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I need, I'm sorry. Right, right now I need to just kind of make sure I, I've got a handle on the Without board, removing the existing structure, you'd never be able to meet the 30-foot rear setback. Do we all agree on that? No. Without removing the existing structure, you this cannot the meet the 30-foot rear setback. What rear addition would? I'm not talking about the addition. I'm just saying, without removing, listen to my words now, without removing the existing structure, you cannot meet the 30-foot required rear setback. Under current well, ordinance. Under, no, there's no well, our, uh, so well. <laughs> I'm, I'm just listen to the words. Don't read anything else okay. into it, okay? I'm just, I'm trying to clarify this for the chair. You, my point being, you cannot come all the way out to 18 feet from the front setback and build a structure because now you've increased the nonconformity of the building because you haven't taken away any of the structure that's in the 30-foot rear setback. You don't have to. You, well, you, well, yes, you certainly do have to. 
he's listen, Walt. Listen, Walt. Listen, listen, listen. listen, listen. Oh, <laughs> the communication needs to go through me. Okay, so let's kind of flow it down, and you need to be on I, microphone, Mr. Mr. I'm answering the chair's. I'm that's, still answering your question. It's about you, and me. So that's really I'm what it's about. I'm still trying right to now. answer your question because I'm confused, and I need yeah, the support yeah, and the explanation. Yeah, so I need to keep it yeah. right here. Okay. So, so I'm trying to answer the, the chair's question. You can't. Even though you, you have a buildable window that goes up to 18 feet from the street, okay, without removing any of the existing structure, if you built out to 18 feet from the street, you're increasing the nonconformance of that structure because you're exceeding the maximum allowed length of the building with a rear addition and you don't have the 30 foot setback. Okay, and it doesn't well, matter if it's grandfathered or not. Is that a question to make? No, no, I'm, no, I'm still explaining to him. <laughs> I, my, my comment was that he could do it without coming, you could come forward, with, you could do this without us if the, uh, if they were staying in the envelope. He's, claiming, he's saying, he's correcting me and saying, no, that's not correct. Is that right? If, what you're proposing right now doesn't exceed the maximum length of building that you could have under the new ordinance. I think that's where you're. I think that's where you're coming from. Right, we have a conflict there on what it says and what it means. Okay. Well, well, what it but what it says is. What it says is you have to have a 30-foot rear set that you have a grandfathered legally non-conforming existing structure, but you still, according to the ordinance, are only allowed a certain length of building and a certain length of rear addition, not to exceed X. You've, you're doing that. You're meeting that with what you're proposing. It's just not in the right location on the lot. How much further? Well, I need you guys. I'm, I'm going to ask you to both sit down in a second. If they went, how far forward could they go and not have to come to the zoning board for a variance? If they were doing nothing else but extending down. Okay. So your maximum building depth, according to the ordinance, and this would be a house. I'm, I'm going to call this a house style. Would you agree it's a house? So it's the house style rather than the, the cottage or the bungalow. The, for the house, a building depth can be 38 feet maximum and a building width 30 feet maximum. You can add a rear addition as a component, and the rear addition can be the difference between what you have left as a 30 foot rear set. In other words, the rear addition can't encroach on the 30 foot setback. So if you start at 18 feet, and you add 38 feet. That's that's the maximum depth you're gonna you're gonna get. And still, no, that's not right. But as long as you're maintaining 30 feet from the rear, so wherever your principal dwelling stops, you have that remaining distance to the 30 foot setback mark on the rear for a rear addition. Okay. Does that does that that part does? Okay. What about the forward? What about the front addition? The, see, in, in in the ordinance, there is no front addition. There's no front addition. So that's why we were talking earlier about this is backwards. If it was flipped around, that's the front addition that they're proposing would actually be the rear addition, which would be conforming. But because of the original placement of the structure, everything's backwards and non-conforming. But they're still not exceeding the total length of house that they could have under the ordinance with what they're proposing. It's just that it's not positioned. They have to come for a variance because they're n because they're not um, meeting the front setback with this new addition. Okay. If this building were placed differently, okay, if it were forward on the lot, meeting the setback, they could they could then add to that and meet that front setback, and that would not require a variance for them to do that. Okay. The side addition still would. If it weren't, you know, taking that off the table for now. Yeah, but, but I mean, that everything's rel What's what's creating this whole hardship is really where the uh, the existing house is positioned on the lot, so far back and so close to the rear property line. That's the big problem. So the reality is, my comment <coughs> where I said they could extend it out to get to the point where they would be in compliance is not an accurate statement. I I say no, it's not an accurate statement because it would exceed the maximum length. I mean. We're already, 
we've got we've got a neighbor complaining that they're doubling the size of the house if you were trying to do this in a compliant manner you wouldn't be able to have that much house right so so no they can't they, what they're proposing is fine as far as total length of house and total width of house I think it all meets it it's just that it's pushed back into that 30 foot rear setback where it shouldn't be and I didn't want to misrepresent to the, yeah. the neighbor I, I was wrong and so my statement doesn't change anything it just means that I was wrong about being able to come not have to go to a zoning board it's still forced because it's a non-conforming lot of record and it can't get forward enough right does that make sense to everyone everybody okay with that okay are you okay with that to make sense well it may make sense but I can uh, only it's not a matter of brother well I can only but I, I can only deal with the proposal right. that I copied downstairs last Thursday or maybe it was even Wednesday and under that proposal what is going on here is asking for a variance admittedly on the street side of the property but because of that variance if if it's granted and I don't think it should be they're going to double the size of the building that's located on my lot in other words the fact that that is a uh, non I'm sorry, what do you mean on your lot pardon me what do you mean on your lot well I meant on in a sense like uh, uh, right up against, against it. it okay fair enough. they're going to double the size double the size of that building by getting a variance here they're going to double the size of the building that comes right to my property and I'm saying that variant should not should not be allowed. Okay. It's not a practical difficulty. Okay, that, that's fair. Variant. Mr. Wilson, do you understand what Mr. Longstaff was saying? You, if you could take my sure, if you could sit down, please. I think I think you're completed. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? I do. All right, well, why don't you go ahead and add the, whatever else you'd like to add, and then we'll have Mr. Wilson. I I want to put in Exhibit 10. It just shows what happened to these two lots. Uh, the lots are 84 and 85 and the Lynch family put that jog in it which results in the uh, oddball frontage okay and and, and I, I just am confused again as to why that jog makes any difference whatsoever in this in this debate because in the application they have to say that it results from or that they did claim that the need for this front variance results in part from the fact that they don't have enough frontage on Pearl Street to place the building as close to Pearl Street as as they would like I don't think they intend to ever move that building though well if, if they can get everything they want by adding on to this building right on the property line maybe not okay. but this okay. this cottage had a foundation placed under it 15 or 20 years ago when Mr. Lynch owned it they could have moved they could have moved that building anywhere but that's a different conversation okay anything else you'd like to add yes uh, state law uh, the town of Scarborough is not permitted to enact an, an ordinance that varies from state law and the, the statute I'm quoting from is 30 hyphen a MRSA section 4353 section 4 hyphen B the title of the section is setback variance for single-family dwellings uh, quote a municipality may adopt an ordinance that permits the board to grant a setback variance for a single-family dwelling end of quote continuing on quote an ordinance adopted under this subdivision or under this subsection is strictly limited to permitting a variance from a setback requirement for a single family dwelling that is the primary year round resident a uh, residence of the petitioner a variance under this subsection may not exceed 20 percent of the setback requirement and not and may not be granted if the variance would cause the area of the dwelling et cetera, et cetera. and what section was that again I have another copy of it it's this can you, can you tell me when those uh, what the date of those properties split was the the actual split um, I could give you some deeds that 
we could derive it from, but it's basically the death of uh, Richard, uh, the, the death of the father. Uh, you already have the deed whereby. I don't have a copy of that. I'm just asking you what, when. Oh, when what the that date of it is? Yeah, again, throwing all this stuff at us at this time is, is really not appropriate. We're letting it go on the record. We're letting you do it, but normally right. that's not acceptable. Both. Well, go, but go ahead. It was, uh, Mr. Lynch died in 1997, and Thank these you. properties were conveyed, one to the daughter, one to the son, okay. roughly a year late in 1998. Thank you. What else do you have? That's all I have. Okay. There may be some questions from the board, but if you could sit down, that would be great. Mr. Wilson, did you understand what Mr. Longstaff was saying regarding the fact that you do? You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, the problem's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it pertains to this, but I do have a problem with what he said. Right, yeah, is it, if it doesn't pertain to it, then let's hold off I on it. It's just the wording in the ordinance. That's okay. all it says. So what I'd like to do is we've got the public hearing open right now. I need to finish that up, then we can come back to the board with issues. Anybody else wish to speak on this issue? If you came up once, you're welcome to come up again. Nobody else? I do have three letters. Um, this is... Uh, Mrs. Eckhart, do you want me to read your letter in, or are you okay with the fact that it, you're okay with the fact that you stated? Okay. I'll leave it as part of the permanent record. Okay. The next one is from Larry uh, Langmore, 14 Pearl Street. Uh, Variances. His address is 16 Pearl Street. Dear sirs, we are writing in support of the variance application submitted by Steve Lynch of 14 Pearl Street, Scarborough, Maine. We understand that the GBA will address this matter on Wednesday, September 14th. We are the owners of the prop house at 16 Pearl Street, and our home on Pearl Street is next door to Steve's. Steve has shared the drawings and plans with us, which Walter Wilson has prepared for his home, and we think this project would be a wonderful enhancement to our neighborhood. Because Steve's house was built by our ancestors in the 1860s, well before Higgins Beach was divided into uniform 50 by 100 lots, and well before any town building ordinance or codes were adopted, this charming and historic house is situated very far from the street. In addition to the front, which Steve is proposing, is architecturally consistent and appropriate for our beach community, and the variance which he requires will allow the addition on the front of the house to be well proportioned with the existing structure and those of the remaining above others. We understand that this, this requires the town to grant a variance to its required minimum front setback. This would be highly appropriate since if the addition was designed to comply with the current maximum front setback, it would have to be much larger and result in a strangely elongated skinny structure that would be much less attractive and more intrusive than what Steve has proposed. We hope you will allow Steve to proceed with the project as he has proposed it. Thank you. The next letter is from Deborah Patch Hutchings, Hutchings, 13 Pearl Street. I am writing in support of a variance application submitted by Steve Lynch of 14 Pearl Street, Scarborough, Maine. We understand that the ZBA will be addressing this matter on Wednesday, September 14th. We are the owners of 13 Pearl Street, and our home is located directly across the street from Steve's. Steve has shared the drawings and plans which Walter Wilson has prepared for his home and we think this project would be wonderful enhancement to our neighborhood. The design is very pleasing and in line with the other homes at Higgins Beach and in keeping with the true character of the area. We hope you will allow Steve to proceed with the project as he has proposed it. Okay, so that's the letters. Uh, I'm gonna allow one more moment. If you'd like to say anything else, sir, uh, you're welcome to take the microphone. If you have anything else additional to add that you haven't already said, you can state your anything you'd like to add. Otherwise, we'll close the public hearing. Under the uh, practical difficulty ordinance, uh, one of the requirements is that the granting of the variance <coughs> will result in bringing the applicant's property more, li more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. I can tell you that the Lynch property is the only property that is 
more or less right on uh, the abutter's boundary line. All on, in all other cases, uh, between uh, Ocean Avenue and Pearl Street, there is a pretty good setback uh, between the main buildings and the property line. So allowing this just perpetuates uh, what already is an, an anomaly uh, in the neighborhood, that is somebody with their main cottage right on their neighbor's back line. In How long have you owned your property, sir? My parents purchased it in uh, 1966. My brothers and I purchased it in the mid-90s. I bought out my brothers in the late 90s. Okay. Very good, thank you. So anybody, else, anybody, anybody have any questions for, uh, for Mr. Fleury? There may be as we come along, so if you don't mind. Okay, so at this point, what I'd like to do is close the public hearing part of this meeting. I'd like to go through the requirements of the um, practical difficulty variance, and as, as you know the routine, <coughs> Wilson. Okay, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Uh, the regular shape of the property, the large front yard setback to the building, and the unusual framing conditions of the building create an un a unique circumstance and therefore need a variance in order to correct. All right, could you elaborate a little bit more on that for me regarding um, why you can't go all the way to the part where you'd be into conformance? In I'm sorry, is why, why you can't what? Yeah, why you wouldn't, make, why it's not reasonable to go all the way into bring it all the way forward. Well, it would be unreasonable to pick up the building and move it forward in the first place. Okay. That would be an unreasonable... Could you explain that for us, please? What's that? Would you explain that for us, please? Well, the existing building sits there. It's on a foundation. It's been there for 156 years, the main part of it. It would be unreasonable just to assume, well, we've got to bring it forward and pick it up and move it. You said it was in three pieces that it was built? Built in 1860. It was added on three times. Added ago. on since in places, yes. Now, something in your, your paperwork didn't show any any additional work with foundation work. Was that just an oversight? or It was just not put in. Um, of course, the original house didn't have a foundation under it. it well, I mean, in your, in your plans, in fact, that you provided to the town, it didn't mention anything about a foundation uh, add-on on the right-hand side. Is that just a... Maybe I missed it, maybe... Well, on the plans, it shows new foundation work it going does. on underneath okay, the additions, yes. Okay, okay, good. Yes, it does. <coughs> All right. Um, Mr. Chair, can I just elaborate on what you... Yes, feel free. I, I want to ask the question, if it were to be moved, would it survive being moved in the shape it's in? Probably not. Uh, to pick that building up and move it, it's, it's very stressful to a building to do that. And... Uh, the way the building is put together, it probably wouldn't survive a pick up and move, but it will survive <coughs> a remodel, reframe inside out type thing and stiffen it up and strengthen the, the main building up in its present location. Any other questions? Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties? The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. The proposed building will not have a detrimental effect on the use of fair market value of abutting properties. And the proposed alterations and additions will also be subject to the administrative review, review to determine the compliance with the character code before issuance of a building permit. Three, uh, the practical variance is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. The practical difficulty result of the zoning ordinance restricted that were placed on the building after it was constructed, and also from the standpoint the building was there prior to any lot lines being established at Higgins Beach. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Um, with the setbacks from the new character code, there is no other practical um, way of doing it without getting a, a variance for the setbacks. The granting of the variance will, res will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly in conformance with surrounding properties. Okay, the way I look at this is not just the land itself, but the building as well. And the granting of the variance will allow the owner the ability to install code compliant stairways, code compliant windows create improvements to the interior space of the house, such as putting in extra bathrooms, 
laundry room area and allowing the traffic flow to be uh, between the existing areas and the proposed addition to be uh, better organized. And the proposal will result in bringing the applicant's property more in conformance with the surrounding properties by making it more code compliant as well. Uh, the granny variance will not have an unreasonably effect, uh, adverse effect on the natural environment. No, it will have none. And the uh, property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area as defined in Section 38 MRSA 435 of Flood Hazard Zone as defined in Scar the Town of Scarborough Flood Plain Management Ordinance. No, it's not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, board questions? Yeah, I want to elaborate on a few things. Uh, go ahead. Um, for the no feasible alternative, I know you'd given us this a while ago now, but I'd just like some more elaboration on all the specific details about why there's no specific, no no feasible alternative for doing this. For okay. one, for moving it, one, for what you've already elaborated on with the building, the kitchen, the walls, the structure, the electrical, the plumbing, the roofing, right. the soundness. I'd like to have elaboration on all that, please. Okay, first of all, the existing build, <coughs> building location is where it's at. And uh, the proposed addition in the front is forward of the rear setback line. So it's in the buildable area that's allowed in the zone. The only reason we're in for a variance is because of that 21 foot maximum setback under the new ordinance. If the old ordinance was in effect and they had a 30-foot setback or a 20-foot setback, as long as you were further back than that, you were compliant. Well, the way the ordinance is written, you've got to be right in that window. And in order to do that, we'd have to build that whole length out to the front and increase all the extra costs on it and everything else to do that. Now, it's my opinion we can do that and meet the, meet the ordinance. Uh, I know what Brian's referring to. He's saying that a rear addition cannot be built into the rear setback, which the ordinance says. But here we are, a grandfathered building. And what he's doing is taking the maximum depth of the building and adding the rear addition you could put onto a building and saying that's the maximum depth the building can be. And in this, in this case, I don't believe that because a rear addition in the ordinance says a rear condition, um, got to get it right here. Wilson, just to stop anyway, a rear addition ha is added to. I, I think um, it's a totally different section of the rule. I, I yeah, it says an extension for, from the rear wall of the main body of a building. We are not making an extension from the rear wall of the main body of the building. We are making an extension from the front wall of the Which main body. There is no rule for it. So then I'd say there is no variance required in order to go all the way to the front. I'm, I'm not so anyway, that's my difference. That. But, so, not, but the practical difficulty of this is we can't build a reasonable addition to the front of the building without getting the front yard variance. Which is what brought us here. Regardless. So that's fine. Okay. I'm, what I wanted you to elaborate on is more of the structural, not, not what you and Brian don't disagree oh, okay. on. But <laughs> the structural part of the building, um, all the walls are two by four. Um, the second floor of the building, I believe the floor joints are two by sixes. Um, no insulation in the walls. Uh, the windows are all non-compliant, single pane glass windows. Um, the, um, like I say, the plumbing of the of, in the house is, is just that first floor corner, an old bathroom in there that did get a, a fiberglass shower put in a few years ago. Um, the electrical. A lot of it is knob and tube. There has been some updating on it. Which is pretty much totally. outlawed now. What's that? It's pretty much outlawed now. Yes. Uh, the stairway is non-compliant in width and height, rise and run on the existing house. needs a new stairway. And within the existing confines of the existing house, there's no room to build a compliant stairway because it takes up so much more room. That's why it's being changed to the front addition to get a compliant stairway in there. Um, the wall heights, um, they vary from 5 foot 9 to 7 foot 2 in the house. Um, this will allow the front addition to uh, maintain regular wall heights, regular ceiling heights, um, and the 
proposed two foot fill in on the side like I stated allows us to bring the wall up to seven foot eight in that section of the first floor the second floor of the house the ceiling heights are uh, six foot six on the walls but they taper up to an eight foot ceiling in the middle so on the second floor of the house we're okay with that other than the framing is two by four and two by six and uninsulated the walls are all open stud some of the rooms are vertical boards you know the gold cottage style thing um, and uh, the paint styles whatever <laughs> you know it needs work let's put it that way why didn't you just rip it down because of the historical significance and the owner does not want to give up the fact that that old caravan shaped living room building is still intact inside there and he wants to maintain that and Mr. Longstaff, if they didn't go out to the front, could they have gone up with this and kept it right within that building envelope? And how high could they have gone up with it if they wanted to? No, because it would have been an expansion of a non-conforming okay. structure. So they couldn't do that either. No matter what non-conforming use is a, is a problem. Okay. Other questions? This is mine. Uh, down to the center of Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Fleury, I'm missing exhibit four, five, and six, and nine. Do you have those? Uh, I do. I, I just want to give you a, an opportunity to put those in if you think there's any value. If you don't think there's any value, don't bother. But if you, if you think they've got some value, then I certainly don't want to not. I, I certainly don't want to take that away from you. One might be an exhibit. <coughs> the, the main revised statutes is that one of them? Yes, but that is not marked. Uh, not marked yes. exhibit. <laughs> but here are here are four, five, six, and nine. And it's basically the, the legal title, and it shows okay. well, just, uh, there's a probate document in there. The remainder of deeds, and it all explains why uh, lot 66 and lot 67. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. If I could take just a minute, uh, Go ahead. I want to correct something. I never said that the 35 foot lot frontage was a reason for the variance. I just mentioned that in my letter because the question had to do with the um, uh, unique circumstances of the property. I did not say that that was a reason for the variance. As far as I can tell, that is not a reason for the variance. And the lot division was done legally years ago, okay, that, w that he's talking about. As a matter of fact, the house on the right was before the board about six or seven years ago. We went through the same thing, and the board granted the variance in order to add an addition in the, the back and on the second floor of that same house. They had a back. <laughs> Okay, let's come on. What I'd like to do is go through each one of the uh, requirements. Uh, Mr. Stark, if you're okay with starting, we'll go right around and then come right back. If that's okay with everybody. Um, I'm going to find my notes underneath my pile here. And I'd like to make this all part of findings of fact, and I'd also like to include any of these exhibits as findings of fact. <coughs> Uh, but I would like to, before we start that, um, could you explain in English to me what this is? Yeah, the um, Mr. F Flurry, is it? Fury? Fury. Fury? Um, he presented a, a statute about zoning adjustments. This, this references a setback variance. For The setback variance in the state statute is actually where our limited reduction of yard size variance comes from. Which that deals with specifically setbacks and nothing else. Okay. okay? That, that's the statute that, that refers to that. What we're dealing with is a practical difficulty variance, completely different statutory reference, okay? So this doesn't apply. Quite frankly, it doesn't apply. Great try, though. 
<laughs> good, good try. It's not, it's not applicable because if we were dealing with a limited reduction of yard size variance, this would be applicable. That's not the variance we're dealing with. Practical difficulty variances are allowed by state statute. The town has adopted a, a practical difficulty variance in accordance with that. Okay? Is that, is that clear? Is that clear? It's, it's, it doesn't pertain. I disagree with you. That's fine. You can disagree with me all day long. It doesn't apply in this case. Good try, good research, just the wrong variance. Okay? Fair enough? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, what are the other notes here? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. As a new member, you entered all these exhibits that he presented into the finding of facts. Yes. I'm trying to understand. We haven't seen these exhibits. Are we considering these exhibits in our uh, decision? They go into the record. They go in enter, enter on those findings. The, they're not. That's a good point. They shouldn't be findings of fact, other than the fact that they are in the record. So that's that's a good point. And just for the record, uh, I'll tell you what each one of them is. Why don't I go through that right now? The first exhibit is uh, ex assessment history of the property, and I, I, uh, so that's what that is. Assessment history of property. The second exhibit is is the. Uh, transfer of the property back in 1950, uh, the abstract and will of uh, Zeldmi R. Lynch. Folks? Folks? Uh, Thank you. The third exhibit is a um, transfer of ownership through a uh, quit claim deed, uh, Robert, J., uh, Robert P. Lynch to his heirs. So it was a quick claim deed. The next exhibit is a let's see. It's just a standard uh, again another quick claim deed with a covenant, uh, a transfer from uh, Raymond Raymond Lynch, uh, who there's a there's a gap there I don't see. To Stephen Lynch and um, his heirs and signs. Exhibit four is a transfer from Robert Lynch to these are not new, these are not in sequence. So just so you know, but what the to uh, uh, Susan Lang uh, Langmore and Beverly. Um, oh, I'm sorry, of Beverly, which I think is the property that was sold. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ms. Flurry's property was the property that was uh, sold. Uh, and then Exhibit Six is uh, a court of probate when Mr. Lynch died, Mr. Robert P. Lynch died, and the heirs. Uh, and there's a trustee's deed that was transferred over during that time. And then there is a deed uh, from Susan Lamani. Uh, to uh, oh thank you 16 Pearl Street uh, Liberty Trust and then exhibit 9 is a personal representative deed I think we've come up I've seen every deed today that I've ever even one and the other one that I've never seen before which the uh, transfer deed uh, this is from Rebecca Lynch. It's a quick claim um, to Stephen Lynch. It was uh, Susan, no, Susan Lang, Lang now, more, which is the property that was sold or split. Exhibit 10 is a layout of the properties, the maps from. Uh, Showing lot 85 and 84 being split. Uh, shows lot 82 as being a double lot. Shows lot 80 as being a double lot. They not they were not all uh, 50 by 100 lots. Some they made some of them were merged uh, automatically as as you know with the titles from the same names. So that's what all of those are. Would you like to look at these further? Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is just get a couple of things on 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 the record, first of all. N number one, as far as uh, the, the, these deeds are concerned, um, 
the the property that I think the question was tied to is it caused by somebody else uh, or, or the previous owner? Criteria three. Criteria three, and I just need to get to that if I can find it. Um, anybody's got the paperwork to be helpful? Right. I'm going to read it to you. Yeah, it's right Please, please. Uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Okay, so the applicant, the, 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 I'm sorry, could you read that again? Sure. The practical difficulty is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. Okay, so none of this, uh, I, I want to get a feel of the board, <coughs> because, uh, and I'm going to go right down the line with each of you. Based on the evidence provided by both parties and anybody else that spoke during the meeting, and the facts before us. Does any, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Mr. Stark. Uh, practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the prior owner. Do you believe there's any reason to assume that the reason they are here today is because of an action that was taken by a prior owner, which was part of the family of uh, this, this family? No, this property has been in this current location for since the mid 1800s, so the, the action was caused by the zoning changes that have happened over the years. Probably not just this last one, but others as well. But it's been there forever. What about the split of the property? When they, I don't see where the split of the property e even has anything to do with it. Because if that property line came straight down, you still have the same. The the, the building is still at the back of the property. It has no effect on it whatsoever. Uh, yeah, you, Mr. Yeah, I would, I would agree, Mr. Longstaff could probably help me out with this. I mean, I don't know if they were all one property and they weren't split. Could they go? I mean, you're still going to have the same property. It's still it's problem. It's still going to sit pretty much on a property line. So I'm pretty sure they couldn't build going out this way where the other pro where the property was divided either to do what they're looking to do. Correct? Because they wouldn't. They would still be right on the line over there, right? They wouldn't be able to. Are you talking about the? Are you talking about the rear property line? Yeah, yeah. If the two properties weren't split, and just say they wanted to add on to the onto the side of it, they wouldn't be able to do it anyways because it's on, it's on side setbacks. Right. Well, I I may be looking at this wrong. I, I I look at it this way. If the variance request was for a building addition that was at the front of the lot, and they were asking for a setback reduction because it was so narrow, they wanted to build wider than the envelope. I would say that that there might be good cause to look at that lot split as the reason why they would be requesting that. Where they're bringing the proposed addition to at this point really doesn't, isn't really impacted by the narrowing, if you will, of the front of that lot because they're not proposing anything forward of that point anyway. So even though that was something that was caused by a previous owner, it's not the reason that they're here asking because the original building, as you said, was pushed to the back of the lot anyway. Is that a fair statement? I, I wasn't here in 1800s when the building was built, but I think it was placed at the back of the lot. Why, I have no idea. You probably don't either. Mr. Blaze that's was. Where, Mr. Blaze, you, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Maroon, that's, that's where I would... That's Our where, historical <laughs> expert. <laughs> that's where I would lie. My assumption on that is based on what Mr. Longstaff just said and elaborated on, it's not affecting what they're here to do. Okay. And Mr. Blaze? I think the reason for the practical difficulty is the fact that the, the cottage is in bad shape and it's in disrepair and they have to make some changes to it. And in order to do that, they have to increase the size of it a little bit to make the walls higher. I don't see anything wrong with it at all. I don't think it's the action of the owner or the previous mm -hmm. owner that bring them here today. Can we do the first two? Or do we uh, I'm intentionally dealing with the, uh, the I'm going to kind of bring <laughs> it right around. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> what I wanted to do is I wanted to address any issues that were, were glaring that haven't been, that we didn't talk about even though it was presented. Uh, so on the, um, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Um, I respect uh, the work that was done of Ms. Flurry. I think I, I did, did a lot of homework on that, uh, and I appreciate that work. Um, however, I, I do not see, based on what the request is, that 
the actions of any of those affect this specific discussion. It could have been part of a discussion if they were going outside of the building envelope or if they're trying to do something different. But I don't see how it affects it, 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 this at all. I think to me what really is affecting this is number one, it's a non-conforming lot, which is everything is down there, is non-conforming. And the other piece is um, that the new regulations have also made it even more non-conforming with the new regulations. One question I would have is, no, it would still be non-conforming because it's sitting, even if they hadn't divided it, we'd still have a non-conforming piece yeah, because it's, right it's on sitting the line. up on the line. Yeah. So no matter what, I'm at, I've got a non-conforming piece, right. Right. which doesn't affect anything. Right. Do you agree with that logic? It, it actually would have been less non-conforming, less non-conforming under the old under the old standards because mm -hmm. uh, the old standards were pushing everything to the back of the lot. It would have been 15 feet from the back of the lot, but not 30. But if they um, hadn't if they hadn't have broken those properties, say those properties were mm -hmm. together, we'd still be here with a yeah. non-conforming property. I believe you're right. I believe that's correct. And, and the logic I'm using is that it's on the line, and so it's by default a non-conforming lot of, of of record, no matter what. I'll just I'll just mention, Mr. Chair, if I could, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. If those lots, if that was a double lot, and it had two structures on it the lot to the right had a structure up front to, in the position that it's in, if that was existing there, and then they, it, you know, I, I don't know how old that front structure was. Does anyone know? The one on the right? So, so, but those two lots were combined and then re-split at some point. I'm just confused as to how they got re-split unless it was one of those, um, Unless it was one of those, um, I'm sorry, sir. So functional divisions. Thank you, because that lot split wouldn't have conformed in 1990 to zoning. Um, so, but I, I don't know the history on those lots, and I didn't go back and, and dig into the the records as as, um, as the uh, neighbor, Mr. Fury, did. But if somebody had come for a functional division, that wouldn't have been a fault. Of no, the and, and the fact that they received a variance in 2007 or something for an addition to that building, I, I believe that would have all been reviewed and looked at at that point, if not before. So I'm 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 assuming that it was all done legally and conforming. I'm a little confused as to just exactly how, but it must have been the functional division thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of jags. They're not all. Uh, yeah, right that so happens many. in a couple of places. They're, they're, yeah, they're, it's funny because they're, they're not all 50 by 100. Yeah. There's a lot of them that are, that are different sizes. Uh, the hundreds accurate. The 50s are all over the place. Um, so, as I see this, 85 and 84, when they were split, was back in. You may know that question, Mr. Do you know when that was split? It came out of the estate. I think you said in the night, late in 1998. And the reason there was no merger, as long as I'm up, the lots were never held in exactly the same ownership. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's, it's, they can't hear you in the mic, so just go ahead and restate it. I just want to make sure you're on the record. The reason the lots were never merged is there would be two members of the Lynch family on one, a trust on another. It was never exactly the same owners for both lots, but they were all members of the Lynch family or trusts staff created by Thank the Lynch you. family. I, uh, I mean, that just, uh, again, comes back to my argument that there's, it wasn't the prior owner because a, a, a trust is an, is an entity, and whether or not they're related or not has nothing to do with it. <coughs> so it just kind of reaffirms my position that there's nothing there. So uh, on number three specifically, uh, again, I'll start with Mr. Stark. Um, your position, uh, actually, we'll just take a vote on number thre three. Um, all in favor that number three is met uh, regarding the, and that's again, the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Um, please raise your hands on this. That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Now, the next section that comes up that uh, I want to deal with is the issue of the 
Um, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties, which I think is something else Mr. Fuller mentioned. Um, again, I'll start with Mr. Stark. Uh, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Well, I, I believe that even though they are asking for, a, for an additional two-foot overhang, they are offsetting that by property that is even closer to the property line that they're bringing in further. So they're, it's, it's less conforming, less non-conforming back there. But all the new property that they want to build is in a buildable envelope. So I don't see where that's an issue at all. The one thing that they will do, however, is they're going to bring everything up to code. And I believe that that's the main point to, to bring that property up to a, a, a livable property uh, with safety factors that are built into the codes today, uh, they just they clearly don't have that currently, and the and the current part, the the, uh, the condition of the property it seems that it's deteriorating as anything would that it's that old. So again, just clarifying, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties, is based on on your view of the structure itself being malnourished. Yes. Okay. This <laughs> is Mr. Uh, Crockett. I believe it will as well. Um, as Mr. Wilson stated, there was um, there's no oven tube wiring in there that, by insurance regulations, is not allowed anymore. So you can't even have no oven tube wiring. Most insurance, just about all insurance companies, won't write it. Uh, the stairways being more in compliant uh, is bringing it up, as well as the electrical and the the spacing, and basically some of the ceilings being at heights that are not really acceptable. I mean, five foot six might work for you, but it wouldn't <laughs> work for me. Um, I'd be bumping my head all the time. And in addition to that, I, I took mention of the fact that Mr. Wilson's also said that they're going to move the propane tank, which currently sits on the abutters land, around to a side, so that will bring it more in performance there, as well as the back doors to the property for the bulkhead or foundation area, whatever it is are going to be moved to the side for the entrance as well, which will bring it more into conformance also. So they're taking the things that are actually on the abutters property and going over or, or opening on there, off from there. And I think it will bring it up to more code as well. Okay. And Mr. Blaze? I agree with Mr. Stark and Mr. Crockett. It's all a matter of bringing everything up to code. I mean, that's the important thing. I agree with the board. Uh, as far as uh, the granting variance will bring uh, re uh, bring the applicant's property more nearly into conformance to the surrounding properties, um, the surrounding properties are not the properties to the left, to the right. The surrounding properties, in my opinion, is the general area, and um, it's about tying it into the new design specs, and also um, along with all the other items you said, but. Um, that the I'm trying to think how to word this properly uh, by moving it by bringing that adding on that space it, it brings it more into that goal of what they're trying to create I respect and understand the, the, the issue of the doubling of the size of the property I'm not sure if it's double quarter or, or triple uh, but the doubling of the size is not a part of that section. It may come up in another one. Uh, but on this specific section, where it could be interpreted that the granting of the variance will result in the property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties, is a, uh, I don't see that specific item and uh, the size, nor do I think it's reasonable to expect that the property would be moved. That's never been the intent. And I would tend to agree that probably wouldn't survive it. All right, so uh, all in favor of number five being met, please raise their hands. That's unanimous. Thank you. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the, pro in the neighborhood. That's number one. Again, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. I, I believe that we already did that one. 
Uh, we did three. We did practical difficulty. Oh, okay, I, I was thinking. I went out of order. First. Oh, yeah, and I realized that. I thought that we had. <coughs> uh, uh, no, clearly, it's the, the, this property is uh, that, that when when the house was first put on the property, it was put at the very back, and it's not some something that you do uh, today. Of course, that may not have been the back of the property when the house was put there either. The property lines may have been rewritten there, and to to put it. Put the property line there, so we don't know because it was so far back. So it's clearly not not the general. It, 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 it's not uh, not the property owners. Yeah, I, mean, it's circumstances. I would say the same. It, it's the um, circumstances, the unique circumstances of the property. I mean, we've got ceilings that are extremely low on one floor. We've got a property that's kind of a made shift. I think there was mention of a cart or something like that that was brought in to build part of the property. I mean, that's certainly a unique circumstance. There's not too many houses that have carts that are found in the properties. So I would say it's definitely unique circumstances of the property. I agree. Um, Fury, just a question for you on your property. Um, I see the shed, but I don't see the prop your, your house uh, listed. How far from the uh, the back of your property to the uh, to your house is it? I'm not exactly sure, but it's comfortably over 30 feet, which okay. is required. Right, thank you. Um, all right, so. Uh, the uh, needs for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Right. We're at Ed. Karen. I'm sorry, Ed. I'm sorry. No, Karen. Oh, Karen. Yeah. I'm sorry. Karen. Oh, yes. I mean, I agree with the board. I appreciate the unique circumstances and the unique property and the fact that they want to preserve it. Um, the need, uh, need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Uh, the, the property is an interesting property. Uh, the reason I asked the question from Mr. Fury is. Um, it, 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 it's interesting how some of the houses were put right on the lines, and it's interesting how some weren't. Uh, this very shed is within 10 feet of the property line. Um, not that that matters. It's just it's that's the nature of the beast down there. Um, but it's also this specific property is there, and the need for the, the expansion um, is just consistent with. Um, the fact that the property is so far back and it can't get to the new regulation, it just can't, it doesn't make sense to me to, to bring it all the way up to the new, to, to, there's no logic to that at some point. It's kind of refreshing to see somebody not try to maximize the piece. Usually, usually it'd be a great excuse to go the rest of the way and actually you're not doing that. Um, so that's that on that. So uh, on number one, uh, all in favor of that meeting the requirement. Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. Mr. Stark. I, I think that it's, uh, first off, the design is going to meet the, the new character of the neighborhood that it's supposed to be. Uh, and also by improving that property, if anything, it's going to bring the property values up, uh, not down. Um, do you feel that there's any issue regarding the extension of the property toward the Pearl Street having effect on the property uh, that Mr. Fury or any of the people in the back have? I, I, I clearly can see the concerns that Mr. Fury has, and I, I am empathetic towards that, but no, I think... I think overall, I, I certainly we've heard from three other neighbors that are even more affected, and they seem to be very much in favor of it. So, yeah, I don't think it's going to have a detrimental effect. As a matter of fact, I think Mr. Ferry said when he was speaking that the property value of this property has gone up substantially over the years, as has his, even with the shape that the property's in now. So, if we're upgrading it, we're making it more to code. We're making it more in what we're requiring for the new codes for the neighborhood and we're placing it better and making it more in line with the front of the properties. I can't I can't imagine that it would be detrimental. I would think it would only increase the values of both of the properties. Mr. Blake? 
I agree. No, I, I mean, I agree. You know, improving the property is only going to improve the property and the values of the properties around it. Okay. And then again, I'm going to read it. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or free market values of the abutting properties. We have three neighbors that are directly uh, abutting that are okay. We have one neighbor that is not. Uh, the items that I remember being talked about were noise, activity, dogs, um, I would argue traffic, cars, there might be more cars in a lot. Um, however, that being stated, the, the, the home itself takes up, um, the, the home itself actually, I, I would argue that the home itself actually insulates the people in the back from any noise or activities because it pushes the behaviors forward as opposed to backwards and the, the, the driveways are up front and so uh, as far as it having a unreasonable detrimental effect on either the use of fair market value of the abutting properties I think anytime we improve anything down there um, th there are zero lot lines everywhere Portland is full of zero lot lines and anytime you improve a property that's near another property and you're not infringing on it um, going closer to it, I, I think that that only adds to the value. So I, so I don't feel that the, the although I respect the fact that there's a potential for more activity, more people in the home, I think Mr. Wilson pointed that there were four bedrooms upstairs, uh, although they were, there's a prior, uh, there's a, um, there's uh, obsolescence in the fact that there's no bathroom upstairs. Uh, the fact is there's still bedrooms up there. Uh, there may be a, there may be, what's the word I'm looking for, practical, um, you should know that term. What's the term on obsolescence? Um, I'm drawing a blank. There's a, there's a legal term for it, and I'm just drawing a blank. But, but the reality is that the, the structure itself, um, Mr. Wilson, this is a question for you. We're not adding any, are we adding any more bedrooms to this property? Could you just do me a favor and take the microphone on that, please? So the part you're doing is you are putting a bathroom on the second floor, correct? And Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Wilson had said on the current structure, the bedroom setup, you have to walk from one to get to another, and I think right. they're changing that so you don't have to walk through one to get to another. Plus, it's going to be insulated now, and it's not insulated now, so you're going to have that sound barrier, and you're moving, like you said, the actions of the kitchen to the front of the property, so most of where a lot of your noise would probably be coming from, dinner and kitchen and preparation and stuff is coming to the front of the property as well. Good point to add on to your points. Yeah, there are existing four bedrooms on the existing property right now. Okay. What will be left, what will be the number of bedrooms? And the new bedroom, lay, with the new layout, will be four bedrooms also. Okay. So we are increasing the number of bedrooms. Or they are getting a more comfortable size in a couple spaces, and you haven't got to walk through one to get to the other. They all have separate doors off the hallway. Currently, do the four rooms have beds in them? They have beds in them now. I've been oh, up, I've been up there and measured them, and I'm tripping over the beds when I was doing it. Okay. You know the properties here. Could you do me a favor and please take the microphone? I just want to confirm from you, sir, that, that there are four bedrooms that are currently in use, and there are beds in each. Yes, room. currently there are four bedrooms. All have beds in them. Um, under the new plan, there will still be four bedrooms. Okay, thank you. That's all. That's right. second floor. How about the first floor? No bedrooms on the first floor now or right. in the future. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Thank so you. based on that, I feel number two is is met uh, because the grant variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character. I think character is a legitimate question. I think the chair has a right to be concerned about that. Although I think that realistically. Um, we're improving two things we're requiring if it gets approved I would require that the tank get moved and we're, I would require that the entrance to the bulkhead uh, to the, the floor which I think you've already both acknowledged on record and that's the official document the scuttle hole is going to be around the other side too so so in those two areas where we're decreasing the encroachment by minor but <coughs> There's some decreasement from it. Any more windows added to the back that is facing Mr. Fury? 
I mean, let me rephrase that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any additional? On the back of the house right now, there yeah. is a window on the second floor at the rear bedroom. Okay. That's got to be taken out with the egress window put in because currently it's too small to meet egress. Yeah. So it's going to be still a window, but it's going to be an egress window, double hung, uh, uh, larger than what it is now to meet code. And I'm assuming it's That's going it. to be uh, double. Uh, yeah, insulated glass. Insulated yeah. glass. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. The next item is number four. There's no other feasible alter feasible, feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. And before I jump on that, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Longstaff to clarify that for us. Is there any other feasible alternative to accomplish what they want to accomplish except this type of variance? Um, I guess I would answer that by stating if, if this particular applicant wants to <clears throat> add any living space to this particular dwelling, I see no way to do that because of the existing non-conforming location. I see no way to do it without the aid of a variance. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stark? No, I would have to agree. Normally this is one that I always vote no on. <laughs> so uh, that's why I asked Mr. M Mr. Wilson the questions I did. And basically I don't feel that there is because he stated that if the structure were to be moved, it may not be able to make it through the move, even if we put, ask them to bring it down and start from the 30 foot and make everything conformance. Where the structure's pieced together, it may not actually make a move. So not to mention the fact that the roof's in bad repair, the electrical's in bad repair. There's many aspects of the property that are in bad repair. There's no insulation. You got two by four, two by six construction. So normally I would say there's a feasible alternative, you can do it. In this instance, due to the shape that the house is in and the things we were being told about it being moved, I would say there is no feasible alternative on this one. Mr. Blake? Um, I don't think there's any alternative if they want to keep the existing house. If they want to tear down the house, then there is an alternative, but they don't want to do that. Uh, and then no uh, feasible alternative uh, is available to the applicant except the variance. Obviously, one alternative is nothing, uh, but the question is, is that feasible or reasonable? Uh, feasible is an interesting word. Feasible implies uh, a, a bunch of things. Uh, the way I interpret feasible is you have the right to be able to have a house safe and secure and meets today's standards. And so given the fact this does not do that, I interpret the word feasible as being uh, you you it, it is it's reasonable and, and in order to be able to do what they want to do feasible um, there is no other feasible alternative as far as the expansion out um, it is consistent with the reality of the old style homes and the way they were designed and bringing into the practical use and functional obsolescence is the word I'm looking for. This home is functionally obsolescent. And based on the fact that it's functionally obsolescent on so many different levels, the expansion of that brings that functional obsolescence into alliance. And just to record that, that basically the bathroom is a good example. Uh, it is reasonable and expected to have a bathroom on the second floor. Actually, in a four bedroom house, it is in these days reasonable to have two bathrooms on the second floor, although that wouldn't be classified as functionally obsolescent in this, this environment. It will be in, in some future environment. Having a kitchen that is designed as a modern kitchen in a home of this type, if you put a smaller kitchen in there or you didn't do the, the kind of designs that are being done, would not be, that would be a functional obsolescence. So I think that it's met. Um, all in favor of four, no feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. Yeah. You didn't vote on this one. I'm sorry, I didn't? Nope. Uh, thank you. Number two. I didn't cross it off either. You, you did it. We did it. You did, it. You did one, two. You didn't do okay. a vote on it. You guys keep me honest. 
All right, so the granting of the variance, this comes back to number two, we'll come back to it. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties. Anybody want to add anything before I ask for a motion? So all in favor of that being met, that's unanimous. Number six, granting the variance will not have an unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. It's done. I don't see a whole lot of changes uh, coming there. Uh, obviously, where the new the new section would be uh, would be uh, some disturbance of the soil there, some impervious soil. But uh, the rest of it, I don't there's really no no change. Okay, Mr. Clark, or Mr. Crockett. No, I don't I don't see anything effect on the environment. If anything, it may improve because they're securing up foundation that's not there now. So whatever may have come out into the environment due to weather or rain or things that may have washed in is probably going to be covered by the, the foundation that they're completing around. I don't see any adverse effects at all. Just positive effects. Thank you. I don't see any adverse effects either. And again, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably effect, uh, adverse effect on the natural environment. Um, the property is taking up more surface, so it is using more, making more surface impervious. Uh, Mr. Longstaff, based on current standards, uh, does the state or any other regulatory agency view that use of that, that addition uh, and you loss of of um, in, uh, per, pervious impervious or non vegetated non vegetated does that have we, any effect on that? we deal with non vegetated but only in the shoreland zone this this property is neither in the shoreland zone nor the the back or front frontal dune um, and therefore it's not an in, in significant um, environmentally sensitive location as are other properties in the Higgins Beach area. So uh, again, in this area, we do not control lot coverage only by the dimensions of the building, the maximum dimensions of the building. That's how we control lot coverage. There's no percentage of building coverage or lot coverage. Very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, so all in favor of number six. That's unanimous. There's number seven and eight, isn't it? On the same page here. Number seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area as defined by 38 MRS A435, a flood hazard zone as defined by the Town of Scarborough Floodplain Management Ordinance. And I think Mr. Longstep has already stated that's not the case. All in favor of seven being met? That's unanimous. Okay. Um, coming to um, The issues again of the transfers. I just want to reiterate my position on this, and I'm going to do this as part of my motion um, to approve as requested um, appeal number uh, 2588, the practical difficulty variance by Stephen Lynch, 14 Pearl Street, Assessment Map U2, parcel 84. Based on the way I view the uh, the, the deeds, and as, as Mr. Fury stated, uh, the, the, the owners were separate owners. So there's, there's no link of this being created by one of the owners, this problem, because it's got nothing to do with it. It would be, the, the, the fact is that the lot is the lot. There's is a lot. Uh, the lot has certain rights based and given to it by the state of Maine and by the town of Scarborough and uh, the newest ordinances. Uh, this conforms <coughs> more with those ordinances. So I, I, as, as important as the history is on these pieces, I, I find that they do not affect that, um, that issue. I also find that the, the noise or other activities uh, would be de minimis. Um, and probably more than likely lessened given the fact that we're actually having real windows and walls that have insulation and the fact that the property at the back of it, there's very little useful property at the back of the house 
and if they were to use any of the property in the back of the house, it's actually blocked by the shed that is within 10 or 15 feet of uh, the back property, which actually would shield that noise activity or behavior uh, from the main portion of the house of Mr. Fury's home. Neither neighbor on either side or in the front has a problem with it. So um, I would feel that that's non-issue. And the, um, and then my, pardon me. I just want to make sure I was covering everything I could think of as my, my points regarding um, the property lines and the, and the fact that this property was put in way before these streets were built. Um, all of these indicate that this is a perfect example and use of uh, the code that is not represented by, um, where's the, uh, the ordinance, uh, the state ordinance. Oh, I have it. Thank you. Um, the, this, uh, the state ordinance that was referred to, which is 30-A, um, I think it's 84353-4B, uh, Title 30-A, uh, 4353 Zoning Adjustment, uh, where it's setback variance for single-family dwellings, although it is an accurate uh, um, document it is tied to a separate uh, variance. The variance that we are using is the uh, practical difficulty variance, which was put into effect uh, in the last 15 years, I would say, by the state. I don't have that on the top of my head. Did you teach me in school? Yeah, but I, I'm, not <laughs> armed. I'm not armed with that information. But that, that rule was placed into effect and offered as a tool two towns that chose to adopt it as a practical variance, a practical, a practical difficulty variance. In 2004, Scarborough adopted that ordinance per state regulation, which is not related to the referenced document that has been brought before us as evidence. Again, yes. That, and, and I mean, I, I, I do commend Mr. Fiore for, for, for doing the research. That particular variance is just another in the arsenal. You have your standard hardship variance, you have the practical difficulty variance, and the state allows you to have a setback variance, which is the one that Mr. Fiore is pointing to there. That's not the variance that we're, re we're using tonight. If it was the limited reduction of yard size variance, that would apply. However, it can apply based on the realities of the circumstance of the property. Right. And so based on all of those facts and the records, that uh, have on, uh, that have been that are everything you've stated on the record. I move that we approve the motion. Mr. Chair, before you move that, yes. Are we addressing the placement of carriage house on the property, or is that? I just want to make sure we're not approving <coughs> that as part of this. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, that I think is a separate. That's a separate request. So, so let me do this and uh, and. Uh, and thank you so much for both of you. If you're both going to say it, we'll beat you. <laughs> I forgot about it. So uh, I move that we approve the request regarding the principal residence and ha with the codicils that the oil, the gas tank is moved and screened from uh, the neighbor and that the hole, what do they call that hole, Mr. Wilson? Scuttle. The scuttle will get moved to the side of the property so that uh, there are two effects of this approval that would enhance, uh, let me rephrase that, remove obstacles that, that are inappropriate uh, in the eyes of the, the, the back door neighbor, which isn't going to meet his needs, certainly, but at least it's something that we have control over. We do not have control of the other items. And do we, need I, to a, do we need to go through the same votes on the carriage house? I just want to bring up that the carriage house is not part of this appeal. Okay. And that the, this approval has no effect on whether or not a carriage house can be placed on this property as my motion. Because I would be not in favor of that. Um, neither would I. We've heard. Neither, neither would I. So uh, that's very critical that, that this motion uh, doesn't. It doesn't address the carriage house in any way other than it is nothing to do with it. It's 
totally separate and divorced. It's it's it's, it's divorced from this issue. Um, and if there's any reference that might have implied that it is in this, that I am removing that from this debate. Does that make sense? Are you comfortable with that motion? Sure. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, we have a second. Are you comfortable with how I've described that? Not really. Do you want to clarify? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, you can see how I described that? Yeah, I think we can do it all. Okay. Uh, I'll figure it out. All right. So, uh, all right, so the motion is moved and seconded. Do I have any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. That ends that section of the meeting. Uh, last piece, uh, anything you'd like to add tonight, Mr. Longstead? Well, are we going to address the carriage house issue at all? Um, it did not appear to me that it was even part of this appeal when I read everything. Well, it was it was part of the request. So let me let me come back to that as a separate item. Then uh, uh, let's discuss that. As I read this and I tried to interpret why that was on there, uh, to me it was almost and I'll be blunt, Mr. Wilson, I looked at that as sort of a sideways slide in. Um, as opposed to an issue directed to Could I offer something to the chair? Absolutely. I, I still, I really believe that the issue of the carriage house goes back to the character requirements in the zoning ordinance that would be handled through the administrative review. I think Mr. Wilson and I are going to disagree on, on that, but we well, do I, on no, so I many agree, things. I agree on that. Um, but I, I, I think, I, I know it's a, it's a, it's a, something that the owner would like to have, but but I think I pointed out in my staff comments, if this were a compliant house in a compliant location and this front addition was a rear addition, which would make sense based on the dimensions of everything, they would not be eligible for the carriage house. That the ordinance precludes, precludes that from, from being an alternative based on the fact that there is massing here in the back of the lot and then to add this, if this was all up front, then this might be different. But with the rear addition and the massing to the back of the lot, I don't think the carriage house can happen. I think perhaps maybe a shed could happen because it doesn't preclude a shed, a one-story thing, but the carriage house with an accessory unit is probably just not going to pass the administrative review. But that's where I think this should be handled. I don't really believe that it needs the, the only way the only way it would come to the board is if we turn it down on administrative review and then they want to come to the board we we haven't turned it down yet because it hasn't been officially right. proposed so i think at that point they could come back to the board and and ask for relief on the character standards that would allow them to have that but just based on the face value of everything it, it really can't happen, but it should. Ha it probably should happen during the administrative review and not in front of the board tonight. I would agree with that 100%. Does that make well, sense? Well, I, it, uh, other, I actually, other than I'm the fact gonna, that I'm not that even going to let it be debated. Um, <laughs> that's how the, the chair. That, that's how the uh, CEO sees it, and that's his right. And I agree with that position as chair. And I think the board, as we voted on it, has taken it off. This this is not part of this appeal has been removed. No, it was an interpretation of the character ordinance That's that okay. Brian and I were looking at to I see for the location of that. Absolutely. And what's allowed in the, in the, within the three-foot side and rear Mr. is Wilson, a carriage Mr. house Wilson, or an accessory unit. I need you to stop. I'm sorry. What we voted on was very specifically removing the carriage house as an issue. If you feel to bring it back forward, you are welcome to do that through the appropriate channels. But I approve, I made my motion very clear, and uh, the record, I want the record to also state Mr. Longstaff's comments in this motion and approval that that is, it, it, you're welcome to bring that forward as a separate item. It is not part of this appeal. Mr. Chair, do you want just to straw poll? Because I'll tell you right now, it's a no for me, and I know it was a no for you. And just if you want to, I'm fine with that if you guys want to take a position. Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be a no. No. Trying to have your answer. <laughs> so in any event, that's, that, I don't want to get into that again. I, I'm absolutely fine with you bringing in. You have a legal right to bring anything forward to the to the uh, to the to the board uh, to uh, 
Well, the only reason it's brought here, and I'm not arguing, is that Brian and I discussed it, and he said he thought the zoning board should interpret the zoning ordinance in this case. And, and I did. In, yeah. in all fairness, Mr. Chairman, we, we discussed it. But as, as we've gone through these proceedings tonight, and I've been thinking about this, I think the actual proper channel would be for us to do the administrative review, turn it down, and then that would allow you two different avenues. You could do an administrative appeal uh, about our decision to turn it down. Right. That could come back to the board. And, and they could rule on whether we were correct or I was correct in, in denying that, or you could come for a variance to the character district. Yeah. Okay. So it gives you two avenues. I understand. But we just haven't turned it down yet, so right. it's really yeah. sort of premature for them to interpret something just that I hasn't actually been. I, just I would like to other, make one, yeah, one really additional important. comment not pertaining to anything well, going on here. Go ahead. But it has to do with this 18 to 21 foot setback that's now in existence out there. For over the years, we had a 30-foot setback, and a lot of buildings were approved for that. That new front back makes all those non-conforming. Mm -hmm. And, and, in business. and so, if they want, yeah, so if you, they want to do something on things that were conforming, the now makes them non-conforming, <laughs> and you're going to be in front of the board because they aren't close enough to the street. I think, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, again, though, just, just and, and to be candid, with you, just so you know, just for the record, Mr. Chair, I would not have been willing to approve this if that were on the table. No, I would not either. Uh, for Mr. Fury's comments, to be candid with you, um, so yep. that's that. Um, I, Mr. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just one quick thing. Next month, October, you guys uh, wanted to have a training session. So it'll be the same night as the meeting. If you could try to clear your schedules and come at 5:30, they'll we'll get some food. And, um, and have Phil Saucier from Bernstein Shore come and give us a primer. And if you, again, if you have any specific topics that you want, send them to me. I've made a list of a few things I think would be helpful. He's also got some canned. Yeah, if, um, you, if, if you've got anything that, that you want, please write it and have it addressed to him so you can get it answered ahead of time. If it, needs, it might require some research. So Yeah, so, so that'll give us a good hour and a half before the meeting to kind of go through some things. And I know Ms. Shoup and, and, and others may have some questions. Uh, James uh, Hebert may also have some questions being a new member. It's a great chance to get that dialogue going and get some answers to those questions. I mean, we're seeing where this, this changes here makes a dramatic distance. I think Mr. Wilson makes up a good point. Any drinks other than Moxie? All right. Uh, any board member comments? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Uh, it's non-debatable. <laughs> All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.